Welcome to the 109th meeting of the National Advisory Council for our Nursing Research. A special welcome to our council members and to the NINR science community. This meeting is being videocast live and will be archived on the NIH videocast website. So thank you for joining us online today. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Betty Beckemeyer and Dr. Suchi Ayala as official council members. Dr. Beckemeyer is professor at the University of Washington School of Nursing and director of the UW School of Public Health's Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. Dr. Ayala is professor at San Diego State University School of Public Health. She also is the director of the Institute for Behavioral and Communities Health, director of the SDSU Health Link Endowment, and co-director of the SDSU Health Link Center for Transdisciplinary Health Disparities Research. As you know, Drs. Becca Meyer and Ayala both attended our September council meeting as ad hoc members. So thank you both for your willingness to serve on council. We are also thanking two departing council members for uh, their service to NINR and our advisory council. Today is uh, Dr. Peter Lewin and Dr. Joanne Wolf's final meeting as council members. And actually, at the last minute, unfortunately, Dr. Lewin uh, was not able to join. Um, but I have enjoyed working with you, Dr. Wolf, as well as Dr. Lewin, and so appreciate your thoughtful council. Uh, and I look forward to opportunities to continue to work together in the future. So thank you so much for your service. We have a lot to cover today. So after we go over meeting logistics, I'll provide my director's report. Of course, there are lots of updates on our research partnerships and collaborations, as well as our efforts related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I'll go over the news on what's happening at NINR and around the NIH. And now I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Elizabeth Tarlov, Council's Executive Secretary, who will proceed with meeting logistics. Dr. Tarlov. Thank you, Dr. Zank. Good morning and welcome. I will now do a roll call of council members to ensure we have a quorum for today's meeting. Please turn on your video for the roll call. Thank you. And please play, say present or here when I call your name. Dr. Atkins. Is Dr. Atkins here? Dr. Ayala. Present. Dr. Beckemeyer. Present. Professor Dawes. Present. Dr. Fitzpatrick. Present. Dr. Holmbeck. Present. Dr. Johnson. Present. Dr. Lee. Present. Dr. Lowe. Present. Dr. Monroe. Present. Dr. Provencio Vasquez. Present. Dr. Stone. Present. Dr. Wolf. Present. And Dr. Sullivan as ex officio for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Is Dr. Sullivan here today? Okay, thank you. Dr. Zank, a quorum for this meeting has been met. I'll now turn to a vote on minutes from the last council meeting. Minutes of the September meeting were made available to you in the electronic council book for your review. May I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? I motion to approve the minutes. I second. Thank you. Any discussion on the minutes?
Okay, any opposed? Motion carries. Council members, you may feel free to turn off your video now. On meeting logistics, first a reminder to mute yourself when you're not speaking to eliminate background noise. This is a one day meeting only. As always, a recording of this meeting will be made available at the address shown on the slide. Closed session will begin approximately five minutes following the end of open session. A separate meeting invitation was sent to council members and all applicable staff with login instructions for the closed session. And a reminder for council members to please turn your cameras on during discussions. Next slide, please. Dates for future council meetings are listed on the NINR Council webpage, as well as in the open session materials in the electronic council book. Please add these dates to your calendar. Our next meeting is scheduled for May 23rd, 2023 in person in Bethesda. I want to remind you that as special government employees, council members may not engage in any lobbying activities while receiving pay for the, from the federal government. Further information regarding conflict of interest and confidentiality requirements are posted in the electronic council book, so please review if you haven't done so already. I will give more specific instructions about conflict of interest and confidentiality at the beginning of the closed session this afternoon. Now I'll turn it back to Dr. Zank for the NINR director's report. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and again, welcome to everyone. I'm pleased to now share uh, my director's report. Since launching the strategic plan in May during National Nurses Week, we've had quite a lot of activity. As you can see here, we funded 109 competing applications in calendar year 2022 and published seven uh, funding opportunity announcements while signing on to a number of others aligned with our priorities. And I discussed the strategic plan in my presentations to more than 50 groups at NIH, HHS, and throughout the nursing science community. Our website has had a lot of activity as well. Pages related to the strategic plan on NINR's website received over 57,000 visits since the strategic plan was released in May. And our strategic plan fact sheet has been downloaded nearly 9,000 times. So we are just delighted that there has been uh, so much community interest in our new strategic direction. And beginning last year, we focused our director's lecture series on the strategic plan lenses. In July, we held a lecture on the social determinants of health lens and in October, we focused on the health equity lens. Nearly 1,500 attendees joined us for these virtual events. And again, we are just so excited to see so much interest in these lectures related to the new strategic plan. But if you miss them, you can find links on our website. Our fiscal year 2023 budget was just signed by President Biden last month. It provides a 9.3% increase for NINR, and I am thrilled to report that this appropriation includes $10 million to enhance health disparities research at NINR. This is a significant acknowledgement of nursing research's expertise and understanding the root causes of health disparities and in identifying solutions that will lead to health equity. Later in the meeting, we'll hear some concepts that will illustrate some of the ways that we think we can best use this funding this year. And now an update on some of our extramural science activities. Since our last council meeting, uh, NINR signed on to 13 funding opportunities and notices. These include opportunities to prevent and manage chronic pain in rural populations, to examine community level interventions, 
for prevention of violence, injury, and mortality related to firearms and other causes, and to address maternal morbidity and mortality. We also expressed our interest in recognizing outstanding mentorship in DEIA and in promoting diversity in the data science workforce. NINR's funded research continues to yield results, including the two papers you see here that were published since our last council meeting. NINR funded researcher, Dr. Robin Gershon, is PI of a project to help reduce COVID health disparities in mass transit workers. Their published findings provide insight into how age and race or ethnicity contribute to vaccine hesitancy among high-risk essential workers. For instance, among the sample of New York City tra transit union workers that were studied, those who were younger or non-white were more likely to be vaccine hesitant than those who were older or white. Understanding the factors that lead to vaccine hesitancy is an important step to developing interventions for those populations, both for COVID and for vaccine hesitancy overall. In another study, Dr. Suzanne Carmichael, who is PI of two NINR projects on severe maternal morbidity and her team examined the ongoing impact of redlining on maternal morbidity today. As you know, redlining is a historical practice of designating black neighborhoods as undesirable for mortgage loans leading to underinvestment in these neighborhoods. They found that living in neighborhoods that had been historically redlined was associated with greater risk of severe maternal morbidity among Black and Hispanic participants after adjusting for a wide variety of factors, including present-day neighborhood deprivation. These findings serve as another reminder of the legacy of structural racism in the ongoing health disparities that we see today. As you know, NINR is a founding co-chair of the NIH Compass Program. This program is innovative for NIH in that it aims to fund community organizations directly to lead this research. It encourages community organizations to partner with researchers and relevant sectors to evaluate structural interventions to improve health. The goals of Compass are being carried out through three initiatives community-led health equity structural interventions, health equity research hubs, and a coordination center. We received an overwhelming response of letters of intent from community organizations by the November 18th deadline in response to the structural intervention funding opportunity. Full applications are due February 6th, and the Compass Coordination Center RFA just closed on January 27th. So I look forward to updating you on awards uh, at an upcoming council meeting. One NINR initiative that I am incredibly proud of is advancing integrated models of care to improve maternal health outcomes among women who experience persistent disparities. Focused on identifying solutions, this initiative supports intervention research to develop, implement, and evaluate integrated models of care that address structural inequities to prevent adverse maternal health outcomes and disparities. So I'm going to share a few details about some of our projects funded through this initiative. These first two studies look at care navigation. One study will center on Black women who are receiving care in prenatal clinics of a safety net hospital system in Metro Atlanta. Researchers are testing the impact of integrating community-based patient navigation into maternal care for Black women to improve maternal health outcomes by meeting social needs, decreasing stress and discrimination, and increasing care access and timely utilization. The next study is addressing health disparities among Pacific Islanders living in the U.S. To address these disparities, researchers at the University of Arkansas are adapting an evidence-based, group-centered prenatal intervention coupled with care navigation to improve maternal health outcomes among Marshallese and other Pacific Islanders. 
The next three studies look at Medicaid policies, benefits, and beneficiaries. The first study is taking place in Pennsylvania, where the state is testing equity-based policy changes to the Medicaid system that explicitly focus on Black populations. These policy experiments include evaluating the impact of healthcare quality inter interventions, including equity incentive payments and reimbursement for doula services on racial equity and severe maternal morbidity. Another study is examining prenatal care coordination, a fee-for-service Medicaid benefit available in some states, which includes health education, care coordination, social support, and facilitated access to health care and social services. Researchers plan to determine the impact of prenatal care coordination on maternal health outcomes, including indications of severe maternal morbidity. And another study is hoping to understand whether Tennessee's expanded Medicaid coverage to persons up to 12 months postpartum leads to improvements in postnatal health outcomes for Medicaid receiving mothers who have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And we are supporting two studies that look at the role of technology in maternal health. A study in Nebraska focus on the, focuses on the protective aspects of Black communities and is testing a strengths-based integrative community care and mobile technology intervention involving doulas. Most research on severe maternal morbidity and mortality employs a deficit focus. But this intervention seeks to improve maternal wellness and reduce health disparities through a strengths-based approach. The second study is testing a novel intervention with Black immigrant women in Brooklyn. We Care About Brooklyn integrates evidence-based community-centered care and community health workers to support family engagement and health care. Community health workers use digital screening and social services linkage system to comprehensively address social determinants of health and reduce severe maternal morbidity. Another NINR effort of note is our leading role in an initiative to examine the impacts of changes in housing and food security policies and programs on health disparities among um, affected populations. In one funded study, by exploring different state housing policies enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic, this includes eviction moratoriums, emergency rental assistance, and tenant legal representation during eviction. Researchers are examining the effects of housing policy on rates of substance use treatment and fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses. Now, this knowledge about the intersection of substance use disorder and housing insecurity can inform policy development and implementation, as well as help to enhance addiction treatment and reduce drug overdoses. In another study, researchers are examining the impact of pandemic eviction prevention policies on morbidity and mortality on racial and gender inequalities. In response to economic downturns associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government increased payments to families receiving SNAP by 15%. We are funding researchers to examine the effect of this nutritional policy change on mental health, including the use of and adherence to recommended care services and rates of adverse outcomes and costs among individuals diagnosed with mental health conditions. And lastly, researchers are using data from the Veterans Administration to explore relationships between eviction prevention policies, homelessness, and use of acute health care resources and associated costs. I am also pleased to share with you some information on our participation in an NIH initiative to understand the impact of structural racism and discrimination on health disparities. This RFA was released in July of last year to address the increasing recognition that racism and discrimination continue to contribute to poor health outcomes for racial and ethnic minority groups and other populations that experience health disparities. NINR funded five of the 37 grants supported through this RFA. 
So I'm going to share a little bit about the NINR supported projects. In a study co-funded with NICHD, researchers are trying to understand the experiences of multiple generations of Black women regarding structural racism and reproductive health. This research will examine how discriminatory policies influence infant mortality rates through risk factors such as maternal experiences of stress, discrimination, and poverty, as well as lack of access to healthy foods, stable housing, and health care. In another funded study, researchers are examining neighborhood level structural and racial barriers to healthcare access that individuals with serious illness and their family caregivers face. By exploring the issue of healthcare access for serious illness through a community based multi level mixed methods approach, researchers hope to untangle how segregation, neighborhood deprivation, and limited access to health care for serious illness leads to poor health outcomes. Another of our funded studies is using a hybrid effectiveness implementation model to improve the efficacy of an evidence-based social determinants of health intervention for caregivers and patients of color. The study employs an anti-racism lens to improve social determinants of health screening and referrals, within family medicine clinics. We funded two studies that focus on HIV and AIDS through a structural racism lens. One study aims to test an intervention to improve the organizational behavior of outpatient HIV and AIDS services to address structural racism and discrimination with the goal of increasing antiretroviral therapy among African-Americans living with HIV. The second funded study is employing a novel intervention to target structural racism and discrimination against Black, Indigenous, and people of color living with HIV at the individual clinic level, while also aiming to improve the well-being of patients and healthcare staff um, at federally funded HIV AIDS clinics. The intervention draws on evidence-based stigma-reducing theories and is being implemented and evaluated at the organizational and individual patient levels. And finally, NINR funded a study on firearm injury risk among Asian Americans. During the COVID-19 epidemic, there was a sharp increase in purchases of firearms among Asian Americans in response to increased experiences of racism. In this study, researchers are examining multi-level risks and promotive resilience factors that affect Asian Americans with an emphasis on understanding neighborhood structural level racism and discrimination to better understand how these factors influence firearm outcomes. So now I am pleased to share an update on our intramural activities. Four DIR staff received an NIH Director's Award for their work as part of the NIH COVID Vaccine and Booster Clinic team for their extraordinary efforts related to the implementation and administration of NIH COVID Vaccine Clinics. They are Kathy Bloomhurst, Joy Res uh, Kreskow, Mary Lai, and Suzanne Wingate, who retired as DIR Clinical Director last year. Congratulations. I'd like to draw your attention to two research papers published by DIR staff since our last council meeting. In the first, researchers looked at a 12-week aerobic exercise program to, de to determine if it helped uh, with fatigue in women with systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. In those with SLE, fatigue can be a debilitating symptom of the disease, and it's hypothesized that cardiorespiratory dysfunction may be a contributor to this fatigue. The authors concluded that the exercise program in this single-arm pilot study improved both cardiorespiratory function and fatigue. Data also suggested an improvement in mitochondrial function, so I look forward um, to future findings from that team. In the second publication, which was a scoping review, researchers looked at 95 studies 
examining blood-based biomarkers of cognitive impairment in cancers other than those of the central nervous system. The purpose of the review was to clarify biological correlates of cancer-related cognitive impairment, as well as to identify gaps and inform future cancer-related cognitive impairment research. And in the same divi division, Dr. Li Chen Shang, an NINR research fellow, developed a low-cost, instrument-free, rapid molecular diagnostic device, which is able to rapidly test stool, blood, and urine for multiple pathogens, including bacteria, viruses, and parasite parasites like C. diff, norovirus, and Giardia. Dr. Shang's device combined two core technologies, the silica microsphere sample preparation and the paper origami multiplex sensor. The technologies received global and U.S. patents in 2022. The tool, which will be used in underdeveloped countries, will help to provide a quick diagnosis and appropriate treatment for effective individuals and families. So I'm going to shift now and provide an update on our DEIA work. In November, NINR, along with um, several other institute centers and offices, issued an OC to fund administrative supplements to recognize excellence in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility mentorship. These supplements to existing NIH awards will provide support scientists who have demonstrated compelling commitments and contributions to mentorship and enhancing DEIA in the biomedical and behavioral sciences. Applications are due next month, or actually this month, on February 17th. As you know, at September's council meeting, we heard from the council working groups on diversity of the NINR-supported scientific workforce and on inclusion in NINR-supported studies. Following the meeting, we received the working group's reports and recommendations. Both of those reports are now posted on our website for everyone to read. We are carefully reviewing all of the recommendations from those reports, and we will be updating you at a future council meeting on how we're implementing those recommendations. And I really want to thank you once again to all those uh, who participated in the working groups for your time and for lending us your expertise. So here are a few updates on our partnerships and our collaborations. NINR is a co-lead for NIH's transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity common fund program which is supporting innovative translational research projects to prevent, reduce, or eliminate health disparities and advance health equity. Now, notably, this pro program, we are so pleased, just earned a prestigious NIH Director's Award for its efforts. So I want to thank everyone involved in that program, including Dr. Shalanda Bynum, who serves as a working group coordinator. And I am pleased to announce that NINR is now a co-chair of the NIH Coordinating Committee for Maternal Morbidity and Mortality. The CCM3, as it's now known, coordinates the NIH IMPROVE initiative to address high rates of maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States. IMPROVE supports research to reduce preventable causes of maternal deaths and improve health for women before, during, and after pregnancy and delivery. It includes a special emphasis on health disparities in populations that are disproportionately affected. So I am very proud to bring nursing's uh, perspective to this important area of research. Additionally, I'm pleased to share that I've joined as the NIH representative, the leadership team for the HHS-wide Social Determinants of Health Working Group. In December, I was really privileged to represent the NIH Social Determinants of Health Research Coordinating Committee and sharing with this working group NIH's interest in and commitment to social determinants of health research. 
NINR is involved in many of the NIH programs and initiatives that were highlighted in that presentation, including COMPASS, HEAL, IMPROVE, and the Transformative Health Disparities Research Program. We are also excited uh, to continue on the executive committee of the NIH-wide Climate Change and Health Initiative. In its fiscal year 23 appropriation, Congress included $40 million to NIEHS for the Climate Change and Health Initiative. As part of her presentation, you may recall, um, on this initiative at September's council meeting, Dr. Gwen Coleman introduced uh, the Climate and Health Scholars Program a residency program to bring established scientists with climate expertise to NIH. So I'm pleased to announce that there will be eight scholars in the pilot 2023 cohort, including nurse science, Dr. Patrice Nicholas, who will be hosted by us at NINR. She leads the Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health at the Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Profession. So we look forward to welcoming Dr. Nicholas. And in recognition of NINR's commitment to addressing the impact of climate change on health, in November, I was pleased to co-author a Lancet commentary with the directors of NIEHS, NICHD, NHLBI, Fogarty, NIMH, and NIMHD. I hope you'll consider reading this commentary describing NIH's climate change and health strategic framework. In 2020, NINR released the RFA strategies to improve health outcomes and reduce health disparities in rural populations. In support of investigators funded through this announcement, in October, NINR hosted a meeting for participants to discuss the status and next steps of their projects. Attendees were able to share their research, form collaborations, and learn from one another. And in November, we celebrated National Rural Health Day with an NIH seminar organized by the NIH Rural Health Interest Group. I was honored to present opening remarks to attendees and provide context for the meeting centered on the intersection of rurality and other factors that impact how research is implemented with rural populations. We will soon post a request for information or RFI on violence against women. This RFI is intended to gather public input on priority scientific directions in research on violence against women. NINR is partnering with the Office of Research on Women's Health and several other NIH institutes, centers, and offices on this RFI. Now, the RFI is expected to be released in the next couple of weeks or so, so please um, watch our website for information on this RFI. Uh, feel free to distribute it widely and consider also sharing your perspectives on this important topic. And now I'm going to share some more news from NINR. Our first director's lecture of 2023 will be on February 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. The lecture will focus on our research lens of systems and models of care and will feature doctors Lucine uh, Pogosian and Ellen Marie Wellen. Dr. Pogosian is a health services researcher whose uh, research focuses on primary care practices to increase capacity and reduce health disparities. Dr. Wellen is the Chief Population Health Officer at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and a Senior Advisor at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. She leads delivery system reform, supporting states to design and test innovative care delivery and payment models, including addressing social determinants of health and advancing health equity. So you can find more information and register for this lecture on our website. This past year, we were honored to have two congressional staff delegations visit NINR research projects in Anchorage, Alaska, and Nairobi, Kenya. 
Both trips were organized by the staff of Senator Roy Blunt, who served as ranking member on the Senate Labor, Health, and Health Services Appropriations Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over the NIH budget. The staff learned about Back to Basics, addressing childhood obesity through traditional foods in Alaska during their visit to the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. The five-year intervention, which includes approximately 800 children up to five years old, aims to reintroduce traditional food from the land and sea, like seal meat and oil, moose, salmon, small mammals, wild berries and greens with high nutrient densities to children who are now more accustomed to store-bought groceries. In October, staff uh, learned about two uh, NIH-funded research studies at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, including the NINR-funded ADAPT for Adolescent study, which aims to improve HIV treatment outcomes among adolescents and young adults in low-resource settings. In the ADAPT for Adolescent study, 880 youth with HIV were randomized to either their standard care or the addition of a peer who provides support, information, and counseling via telephone. The study is looking at visit adherence, viral load suppression, and cost effectiveness. Several staff has, have joined us at NINR since our last council meeting. Jackie Wilson is our new Information Systems Security Officer. Hope Mabry has joined the Office of the Director as an Administrative Assistant. Mary Bowen is a new Program Officer in the Division of Extramural Science Programs. Nisan Buchacharu has also joined as a Scientific Review Officer. And two Presidential Management Fellows recently joined NINR, Christina uh, Denit Roberts and Maureen Akubu Odero. The PMF program develops leadership skills in advanced degree holders, and uh, it's really a call to service to potentially become a future leader in government. So welcome to all of our new NINR colleagues. At the end of 2022, we did say goodbye to two long-term NINR staff members. Deborah Jennings and Mary Kelly both retired at the end of December, and I want to thank them for their incredible service to NINR and wish them all the best in their retirements. In November, NINR held a two-day workshop on the potential of nurse-led research on firearm injury prevention. At the workshop, Dr. Teresa Richmond provided an overview of why this topic is an excellent fit for NINR and nursing research's perspective. For instance, according to 2021 data, firearms are now the number one cause of death in the United States for those 20 and under. This is not just a criminal justice problem, it's a public health problem with over $1 billion spent annually on hospital costs according to the Government Accountability Office. It is also a health equity issue. Firearm injuries and deaths are not evenly distributed by race, ethnicity, and gender. And I want to thank everyone who attended the workshop for their interest in learning how nurse-led research can help prevent firearm injuries. Now, I strongly uh, believe in the potential for nurse-led research in this area. In fact, in 2023, the issue of firearm injury prevention will be our first strategic imperative for the Institute. Later today, we'll hear from Dr. Christine Hunter, Acting Director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and Dr. Thomas Simon, Senior Director for Scientific Programs of the CDC Division of Violence Prevention on firearm injury prevention and related research activities. We'll also hear several concepts today for Council's consideration. These concepts include two on firearm injury prevention. So I certainly look forward to Council's thoughts on the concepts during the open discussion. So I will now transition to sharing some news uh, from NIH. 
just a reminder that the new NIH data management and sharing policy is in effect for competing applications, contracts, and other research proposals submitted on or after January 25th. We encourage investigators to check the resources available through the NIH Scientific Data Sharing website and to reach out to their program officers with questions about DMS plans. One future option available to the research community uh, for data storage and analytics is the NIMHD SHARE platform. Now, SHARE stands for Science Collaborative for Health Disparities and Artificial Intelligence Bias Reduction. SHARE is a cloud-based research collaboration platform developed by NIMHD with input from NINR. In anticipation of the final rollout um, sometime this month, NIMHD will be offering a series of SHARE Thinkathons to help prepare researchers, students, and their collaborators to use the SHARE platform. In October, President Biden appointed Dr. Renee Weg Wegerson as first director of the newly formed ARPA-H. Dr. Wegerson worked for both organizations that inspired the creation of ARPA-H, DARPA, and the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. And Dr. Larry Tabak, who's performing the duties of the NIH Director, selected Dr. Joni L. Rudder to lead the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. Dr. Rudder joined NCATS in 2019 as Deputy Director and served as the Acting Director of NCATS since April 2021. Dr. Monica Bertinoli became the 16th director of the National Cancer Institute in October. She was previously affiliated with the Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And Dr. Nina Shore is the new deputy director of the NIH Intramural Research Division. She had previously served as Deputy Director at NINDS since 2018, and I certainly look forward um, to working with all of these colleagues in their new roles at NINH. Dr. Tony Fauci, as all of you know by now, retired from federal service at the end of December. Dr. Fauci had over 50 years of service with the federal government and served as Director of NIAD since 1984. Dr. Andrea Norris also retired at the end of December as NIH's Chief Information Officer and Director of the Center for Information Technology. Also earlier this month, Dr. Roger Glass stepped down from his positions as Director of the Fogarty International Center and NIH Associate Director for International Research. And finally, Dr. John Gallen, the NIH Associate Director for Clinical Research and Chief Scientific Officer of the NIH Clinical Center, announced that he will retire in March of 2023. I wish all of my colleagues the very best with their next endeavors, and we will share updates at future council meetings as permanent directors for these important roles are selected. And as I wrap up, I want to acknowledge Joni Dawson and Joanne Kriebel for all their help compiling this um, update. And I want to thank all my colleagues here at NINR and on Council for your support of the Institute. Please feel free to reach out to us at any time at the email address you, that is shown here. So thank you so much. So we are going to transition uh, now uh, to the next agenda item. So I'm going to introduce our first guest speaker, but first let me confirm um, that he is here. Let's see, Dr. Reed, are you here? You think uh, Dr. Reed is not here yet? Would you like to take a quick break? Sure. What What do you suggest in terms of timing? I would suggest a five minute break, and then we can reconvene. Okay, great. I guess we could also pause 
uh, just to see if uh, any of the council members have any questions or thoughts based on that update. Dr. Zank, all I can say is it's just amazing. It's just so amazing to see such focus in so many different areas around health disparities. I'm just, just warms my heart to know what direction we're going. So it's great, I love it. And I can't wait to know who's gonna get funded for Compass. I have no involvement in any of them, so I'm really looking forward to just cheering on those who get funded. Thank you, Dr. Ayala. Me too, very excited about Compass. Agree. These are really, really exciting directions. Love, love seeing where the NINR is going. Yeah, me too, Dr. Zank. I, I love the focus on rural health and, and then, and the, uh, firearm prevention, I think is just so, um, salient right now, just a great kind of, um, pivot and just, I, mean, I love seeing that nursing getting engaged in that space. All right. Anything else you want to add? Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Dawes. I see your comment. All right. So then let's go ahead and take, give ourselves five minutes to catch our breath and uh, we'll uh, come back on and see uh, and hopefully be joined by Dr. Reed. So that'll make it uh, 1151, 11.51 to be precise. So I'll see you all then. Thanks. Welcome back. I'd also like to welcome council members, Drs. Atkins and Sullivan, who have joined us. Welcome. So um, we will move to our next agenda item. Um, so let me introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Bruce Reed. Welcome, Bruce. Uh, Dr. Reed is Deputy Director of the NIH Center for Scientific Review. CSR's mission is to see that NIH grant applications receive fair, independent, expert, and timely scientific reviews, free from inappropriate influences, so NIH can fund the most promising research. Dr. Reed came to NIH in 2015 from the University of California, Davis, where he was a professor of neurology. There, his research focused on the interaction between vascular factors and Alzheimer's disease pathology. At CSR, he directed the Division of Neuroscience, Development and Aging before becoming deputy director. He has been instrumental in enhancing CSR's outreach and communications, in developing new peer review training and policy resources, and in an and in an initiative to simplify the review criteria for research project grants. Most recently, Dr. Reed led the CSR Advisory Council Working Group on peer review of NRSA fellowship applications. He will talk to us today about that work, so I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Reed as he gives us an overview of recommendations of the CSR Advisory Group Council Working Group on Peer Review of NRSA Fellowship Applications. Dr. Reed, welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Um, thanks for having me and a chance to talk about this, uh, this initiative. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is a set of ideas for improving the review of NRSA fellowship applications. So where did these ideas come from? <clears throat> so most basically, CSR is committed to implementing changes in the peer review process as needed to make it more fair, effective, and efficient. So the these ideas grew out of an initiative from CSR. It's just one of multiple initiatives that CSR has taken in pursuit of this basic goal. Um, more specifically, with respect to fellowships. So NRSA fellowships support intensive research training for individual pre-doc, post-doc trainees. Um, NIH gets about 6,500 fellowship applications each year and CSR reviews over 80% of them. So we were concerned when we heard from applicants and reviewers alike, um, concerns that the fellowship review process may be disadvantaging some applications who were in fact highly qualified. And so in response, uh, CSR formed 
CSR's council formed a uh, working group that was in September of 2021. Um, over the next year, that <clears throat> working group gathered data on review outcomes. It got public input. It got input from across NIH. And in September 2022, um, we brought the final report and recommendation to our advisory council which uh, endorsed that report and recommendations. And then over the following three months, uh, the ideas <clears throat> made fairly quick rounds uh, across NIH, um, various major leadership groups. And in December of 2022, the NIH Institute directors approved the major recommendations of this working group and NIH leadership asked that they be implemented. So this is a set of ideas that will be going forward and NIH will be working to get these uh, in place over the next couple of years. So let me tell you more about these. Um, first, the working group itself, uh, there were NIH staff, a couple of members of our advisory council, uh, and then a set of ad hocs. The ad hocs were all uh, very committed to fellowship review. They had personal experience uh, generally both as uh, in, in submitting applications and in their review. And uh, they, were a they were a diverse group um, uh, representing a, a range of career stages and different types of research in institutions. So they brought a um, diverse set of perspectives to the process. I want to highlight a few of the findings of the of the committee because they sort of set the stage for the recommendations. So first, in terms of public input, uh, we had published a, a blog asking people to comment on the review process. And these were the themes that came out of our content analysis. So four things. First, there were concerns about bias, bias that favors big name schools, um, big name sponsors, well-funded labs, bias that uh, disadvantages early career sponsors, non-elite schools, women, underrepresented minorities. We also heard a lot of requests to change the information <clears throat> that was uh, required in the application. For example, um, the, the, the requirement that uh, applicants submit undergraduate grades was quite unpopular. There were concerns about the application itself um, and the burden of review. Uh, the concerns were that the application was too long, duplicative, it didn't align well with review criteria, and we also got requests for enhanced training, um, training in bias and so forth. Um, <clears throat> as I say, the group also got information on review outcomes. So we pulled the data from the uh, 6,676 fellowship applications that were submitted to NIH in 2022. And um, I'll show you just a, a couple of things with, with respect to those. So first, you see that applications are highly concentrated in a small number of institutions. And that's what you see in this skewed distribution. So um, institutions are, um, distributed according to the number of applications they submit in a year. So the bottom number here is the number of applications that schools submitted in 2022. The top number is the number of schools that fall in that bin. So if you look at this, look first out on the right hand side. And what you see is that there were 15 schools that each submitted over 100 fellowship applications. These 15 schools alone accounted for almost 30% of the application of the fellowship applications that NIH got. At the other end of the range, you see there were over 100 schools that submitted either one or two applications that year, and there were almost 100 more that submitted between three and 10. Perhaps not surprisingly, Applications from those institutions that submit low numbers of, of, of applications have worse review outcomes. So what you're looking at here, um, <clears throat> uh, schools are grouped according to how many uh, applications they submit. The, the, the low submitters are on top and the very frequent submitters are on the bottom here. And then we 
um, code the review outcomes. So in yellow here, this is the proportion of applications that fall in the that score in the high impact range. And if you compare the the those that submit the fewest to those that submit the most, you see a big difference. So about 29% of the applications uh, for these low low frequency submitters fall in this high impact range. On the other hand, those that submit the most, almost 44% fall in that high impact range. And another, another thing that sort of pops out at you um, is that junior sponsors do poorly relative to senior sponsors. So if you just look at the top four bars here, these are applications where there was a single sponsor. You can have multiple, but these are single sponsor applications. And the assistant profs are on the top, uh, professors down here, and then there's this other category. This other category are typically pretty senior people. They're department chairs, deans, uh, HHMI investigators. And again, you see, so you can you can see how the success rate or the, the proportion of applications falling in this high impact range increases uh, as you sort of move up the uh, faculty uh, ladder ranks. So to summarize the picture that the group got, um, first of all, they, uh, you know, we heard from multiple sources concerns about reputational and career stage bias. We heard information about the applications used to judge applicants and uh, concerns about the application itself. The data, as I just showed you, uh, show that the, uh, that the applications are concentrated in a small number of institutions. And the concern is that the knowledge and resources needed to support a good F application are very unevenly distributed. Of course, it's also a concern that the applications from those highly resourced schools do better. Um, so I just showed you the senior scientists do better than the earlier career. And the bottom line concern was that the NIH is leaving out some highly promising uh, young scientists because of a process that too heavily relies on elite institutions or that favors elite institutions, senior well-known scientists, sponsors, and an overly narrow emphasis on traditional markers of early academic success. So that's the problem that the group tried, uh, you know, made, made recommendations to change. And so let me go over their recommendations. So um, they made a comprehensive set of recommendations to modify the, the review criteria, the application itself, and then some additional recommendations about training, outreach, the review process itself, and a couple of other things. I really want to focus on these two major recommendations. This is really the meat of the uh, ideas. So they were, the two major recommendations were to change the fellowship review criteria and to change the fellowship application. <clears throat> so specifically, there's a fellowship supplement to the PHS 424 that you fill out when you apply. That's what they recommended changing. And the, the basic goal here with both of these changes was to improve the chances that the most promising applicants, no matter who they were, where they were based, would be consistently identified in peer review. So this first recommendation was to modify the review criteria. There were probably three key ideas the group was working with in modifying the criteria. First was the idea that we ought to better focus reviewer attention on three key assessments. So get, get reviewers to focus on the potential of the applicant, the strength of the science, and the quality of the training plan. Those are the key judgments reviewers should be making, and these became the three core criteria. The second idea here was to define criteria in a way that would give less advantaged applicants a better chance without disadvantaging anyone else. So how do you how do you do this? <clears throat> uh, how do you 
as, as one of the as one of my uh, as, as my co-chair Elizabeth Via would put it, but how do you uh, allow the review process to identify the diamonds in the rough? You know, without disadvantaging your traditional sort of academic stars. And the ideas that they worked with were to evaluate the applicant accomplishments and trajectory in the context of the opportunities that they'd had. And that in addition to accomplishments, to evaluate personal characteristics that also contribute to success in science. And the uh, third idea was to reduce bias in review by reducing inappropriate consideration of sponsoring institutional reputation. So instead, really focus the evaluation on the quality of the science and the quality of the training plan. So a little bit, <clears throat> so how does this play out? So uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the current criteria. They're over here on the left in this uh, sort of yellowish tan. and the five current criteria are applicant or fellowship applicant, the sponsors, the research training plan, training potential, institutional environment. The recommended set is just three, as I said, those being the scientific potential, the goals and preparedness of the applicant, the science and the scientific resources, and the training plan and training resources. So you see right away that the group recommended deleting these two current criteria. And it's not that all considerations are gone. I mean, it obviously matters who the sponsor is and, and the institution, but it matters in a particular context. And so those considerations are woven into these, into the evaluation of the science and the scientific resources. What does the sponsor bring? What does the institution bring to the science and the, and the and the training plan. Um, the other uh, recommendation of the group regar uh, regarding peer review criteria was to eliminate the peer review of financial support for the proposed research. Um, the idea is that when you require this, but what, what people basically end up doing is looking at a list of how many R01s the sponsor has and it's uh, kind of an inherently biasing process and not really, really relevant to the quality of the, of the uh, proposal and the quality of the training plan. Um, so, okay, so that was the first recommendation to modify the review criteria in the way that I just um, went over for you. The second major recommendation was that NIH should modify the fellowship supplemental section of the PHS. <clears throat> In other words, modify the application, modify what we're asking uh, applicants to tell us. And the, uh, the principles here were, were these four. The ideas were to, uh, to modify the content of the application with the, re with the review criteria, to try to discourage the, the use of easy but incomplete and often misleading indicators. What are those? So for example, grades. Grades are easy to get a hold of. They're often, they, 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 they lack context and they're often misleading. Um, third idea is to emphasize substantive statements pertinent to the individual student. Try to, try to discourage the use of boilerplate language and to restructure the, uh, the whole thing in a set of word limited statements. And in so doing, we could actually cut the length of the application by two and a half pages. Um, so to summarize uh, the, the changes in the application, you can think of this as, you know, sort of what's the information that we're asking people for? What's the information <clears throat> uh, on which reviewers are supposed to make these judgments? So, uh, the changes in this, first, eliminate the grades, el eliminate the requirement for grades. Um, what courses people take are, uh, successfully is relevant, and those would be continue we would continue to ask for those. We would revise the fellowship application section, so the statements from the applicant um, with the goal of better assessing their scientific thinking and to get a broader um, sort of view of their qualifications. Um, 
we would revise the sponsor and collaborators section with a goal of putting greater emphasis on what the sponsor's approach to training and mentorship is. How's the, how, how does the plan fit this particular student and, and their goals and needs? And then revise the letters of reference, asking questions um, that will require answers that are very specific to the particular trainee, again, intended to discourage boilerplate, make it easier for reviewers to evaluate across candidates. The research training plan would not change. This is where you find the science. And a sixth uh, uh, proposal was to allow an optional statement of special circumstance. This came out of the um, community. It was one of the ideas that uh, surfaced in uh, response to the blog that we published. And the, the idea was that there are situations in which um, people have had their career uh, or their training um, delayed or derailed um, and you know, because of harassment or other personal circumstances and that people should have a chance to provide an NIH uh, statement about that. So that's the, that's the overview of it. Um, I'll show you, I'm, I'm not gonna read through all of this, but it is in your slide set. Um, and you can look at it in more detail if you want, but if you can, what, what you see on this slide, you've got the current setup of the applicant section, the sponsor section, the letters of reference, and then over our, here on the right, how we would modify, how the proposal would modify those sections. Again, the research plan itself remains the same. So there are substantial changes in a, in a in what we would require of applicants and sponsors. Um, okay, so um, so where are we now? Um, <clears throat> we will be issuing a request for information this spring. And uh, this the request for information will serve a couple of functions. One, it um, communicates to the community NIH's intent to make these changes. It also gets um, final community input on these ideas, and it gives the community a chance to weigh in on things that they might like, that they find unclear um, uh, or inconsistent or you know, various changes that they would like at that point. So it's a, so it's a final sort of iterative um, uh, request of the community to give us feedback as we move forward. So that will be coming out this spring. The implementation itself, as you probably um, can appreciate, perhaps not, but it's a it's a complex, multi multi pronged process. And a lot of a lot of move, there's a lot of things that need to change. The application itself needs to change. Funding announcements change. Our the NIH's business systems uh, have to change to reflect the different criteria in the in the content of the application. Our information resources that we provide to the applicant community and to reviewers, that all has to change. It's a major training and outreach effort. We have to, we have to communicate this to reviewers, to applicants, to applicant organizations, and of course to our own staff. So there's a lot to be done there. Um, this uh, probably looking at a period of uh, one and a half uh, to two years to get this finally in place. So um, there's a couple of links there um, where you can get more information. And um, before we move to discussion, I just I, I want to sort of come back to where I started, which is that this initiative is one of many that CSR has taken with the goal of uh, making peer review more fair and effective. Um, you can, I'm not going to go through those now, but uh, you, you, we do have resources on our website if you want to learn more about this and get a sense of the multi, multiple uh, steps that we're taking in, the, in this area. So um, with that, I will uh, pause and uh, take down my slides and we can talk. So thanks much. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for joining us and for that overview. So 
Um, I've asked uh, Dr. Stone, one of our council members, to help lead us in discussion. So, Dr. Stone, please proceed. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Reed, thank you, and to the working group. I think this is so very much needed. Um, you know, we really do need to diversify our scientific workforce and find ways to do that. I, as somebody that's helped a lot of people with F31s and been on the review process, I love the fact that you're taking out the repetitiveness. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really good about the recommendations, many things, but um, is that, you know, increasing the diversity of the reviewers to get people from these these schools that don't do it very much becoming expert in it. I think that that'll be really helpful. Personally, I was less worried about the data about the senior staff, you know, the senior scientists, because I think that's the a role of a senior scientist is to mentor junior scientists. So they should be serving as a, you know, a co-sponsor with the junior scientist to get the junior scientist to help. But, you know, but the, the data about the 15 universities with more than 100 of 31s is, you know, it, it's remarkably bad. <laughs> you know, we, we've got to do something. And so one of the things that I think about is how do you actually ensure that the, these diamonds in the rough or the, you know, um, coming from universities, you know, schools that they can afford, but they really have potential. How do we make ensure they have the resources? I, I know that in nursing, we have many um, PhD programs in schools where there's not a faculty, faculty have PhDs, but there's no research going on. Um, and so I've heard that it's been tried before and it wasn't that effective of putting schools together, you know, and partnering them. But I just, you know, thinking about how we could ensure that we're um, spreading the resources and making win-win situations to help. I think, I think we could use a little bit more thought on that, you know, I mean, there might be ways to like, share indirects or, you know, and have two schools supporting an applicant. I, you know, I don't know. That's off the top of my head. But I think there's goals there that are so worthy that and I'm so glad you're doing this work. Um, you know, but I, I just I want to make sure that we get the resources spread out to help these people. Yes. Um, well, <clears throat> thanks for your um, supportive remarks. Uh, I. You know, it, it really is a it, it really is a challenge. Um, I sort of light pedaled the out the outreach and um, training aspects of the group's recommendations, but it, it's it's not because they're not important, but I think because they're straightforward. And one of the recommendations was that NIH really needs to target its outreach. Uh, you know, the as you say, one of the one of the consequences of that sort of concentration of experiences that you have people who have tremendous potential and they don't have somebody there who can help them, who can just give them the guidance of, you know, how do you do this? How, you know, how do you put together an application that looks good? That's kind of, you know, what kind of things do reviewers look for? And so, uh, I, you know, in addition to the outreach, I do think that um, as we diversify review panels, um, we can have we can have somewhat of an impact. You know, I mean, there is, we, we need to have people on review panels who have experience, but um, it's it's valuable to have people who have a range of, of perspectives. So it's important to get reviewers from, you know, not just the elite schools, but the, there's a whole lot of schools that are very, very solid that are not in the, you know, this is this elite group and they have lots of, um, potentially good reviewers who, and, and that is a group that we try. Um, some of the other things really sort of fall in a, uh, fall to program about what kind of incentives or structures could you put in terms of uh, funding announcements or programs that, as you say, might have partnerships uh, between some of the less resource schools and some of the more. It's going to take sustained effort over a long time. <laughs> 
I, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, any other comments by any other council members? Cindy. Cindy. Thank you. Um, I, I was really interested in the idea of assessing scientific thinking. <clears throat> and it looked like that kind of lined up with the self-assessment and the scientific perspective statement by the applicant. And I'm, I'm wondering how you do that in a short written piece. What's, what's the vision for how that would inform those diamonds in the rough? Well, um, I, I, I think you described it fairly well. I mean, I think it's a challenging assignment, right? You, you have a, you have a short, you have to write a short statement that sort of outlines your scientific vision and why why this problem is interesting to you, what do you think the importance of it is. And it's, um, that's a tough thing to put together, but hopefully it does give reviewers a chance to look at how the candidate does think scientifically. Um, you know, it's one indicator, it's one look, but but it's but at least it's directly relevant to what to what we want. Can I ask a follow up to that? Yeah, yeah. I think for for nursing, one of the troubling things is how late people get into their F thirty one. So, given that our there's been a push to make our PhD program shorter, there's it's a really sort of a race to try and get funded before you're finished with the program with an F thirty one. And particularly for F31 students, I'm not sure they, they can coherently talk about their grand vision and their scientific perspective at early in their program. I mean, they are developing scholars. It might work better for, an, for the F32, but for the F31, unless we want them to delay to the very end of their program when they do have their own grand perspective, I think it may further disadvantage people to say, if you can't articulate that very early, then you're pretty much out of the game. I think, you know, um, it, it is, uh, what I want to say, it, there, so, so it is a situation where people are competing with each other at the same level. I mean, I, 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 I take your point that some people come to that with greater advantages and some people come to it, you know, the, it, it, it's not necessarily an entirely level playing field, but it does, um, but it does give the applicant a chance in a way that, um, you know, credentials and grades and don't don't always give and and you know just the school that you've been admitted to or that you can afford you know it takes some of those things out and does does give the up does give an opportunity for reviewers to hear directly from the applicant and and to get a chance to see how they think about science and what drives them so it's and, and as you say they are the, the the review committees are very cognizant of the level at which, you know, the level of science, the level of training. And I think as a training uh, issue, you, you're not going to want them to expect, you you don't want them to expect the same kind of things that they'd expect out of senior folks. You know, you know that's, that, that wouldn't be right. Betty, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, just real quick, and I'm not sure exactly what this would look like, but, um, and I, I don't think you mentioned this, so stop me if I'm wrong, but the CTSAs, did you, um, Dr. Reed, did you and your committee think at all, talk at all about leveraging the um, value of the CTA, CTSAs in terms of providing training and support for some of these um, scholars in institutions where they have less research support the, um no the we didn't get to that sort of um implementation level but i i mean i think it's a it's a good idea it's a good resource and and one that nih should think about as we try to 
as we as we do implement these ideas and um yeah i think it's a good idea so i don't think there's another hand raised so i'll build on that it's funny that we're asking a similar question betty uh, because it, it looked to me good uh, thank you that was a great um talk really appreciated it dr reed it looked like part of what um we're trying to do is sort of not have the bias toward institutions. So I'm at San Diego State University. We're not an R1, but we have a lot of research active faculty. I'm also a recent um, director of a U54 center that's trying to build that infrastructure. And so I appreciate less focus on the things that we just don't have, right? But I like, I was gonna make the same comment as Betty. What can we do to augment those facilities and resources, the training resources available structurally so that they're not continued to be disadvantaged? I mean, I'm always, I freak out when I see a facilities and resource page from an R1 institution that I know that our students or our faculty are competing with. And so at U54, I'm like, okay, this is what I need to try and do to help build that infrastructure for them. I'm but frozen. is there more that can be done? I don't know. I would love to talk more about that. Yeah, I think, um, as I said earlier, I, I sort of light peddled those recommendations and the group didn't spend a lot of time sort of fleshing them out how you would implement it. Because, But the need is really clear. And I think it is something that NIH needs to pay more attention to and think about Think about um, outreach and training from that perspective. I mean, which is to say, we need to think about those programs from the perspective of the people who need it the most. Yeah. You know, there's institutions that really don't need it. They, they completely know how to do this at a very yeah. high level. There's, but there are institutions where they've got really good people, Frozen and great potential, need more resources, and I think. Yeah, that's that's something that we need to put some effort into. Well, again, I just think that it's so needed, and <laughs> thank you for where we are. We see it. It really was lovely to hear your presentation. Thanks very much, Pat. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Reed, for joining us. Thank you, Council, for that rich discussion. And um, we look forward to future updates on this. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Okay. Thanks much. Bye-bye. Bye now. So we're going to move on uh, to our next agenda item um, before lunch. So we're going to have two presentations um, on new concepts. So as you know, in your advisory role uh, to the NINR director, you are NINR's source of non-governmental advice on research directions and scientific priorities. NINR seeks counsel's advice for long-term planning at an early stage uh, by presenting concepts for clearance. A concept is the earliest planning stage of an initiative before releasing an RFA, an RFP, PAR, program announcement with set-aside funds, or contract. A concept describes the background, objectives, and potential mechanisms for the initiative, but any approved concept may or may not ultimately become a funding initiative based on any number of factors, including fund availability. So at this point in the agenda, NINR staff will present two concepts for your advice. These concepts were made available on the Electronic Council book for your uh, review in advance of this meeting. So NINR Program Officer, Dr. Chris Bowe, and Presidential Management Fellow, Dr. Ristina Denise Roberts uh, will present a concept on training in social determinants of health research. And then following their presentation, council member Dr. Atkins will offer comments to open the discussion. So Dr. Bo, uh, please proceed. It's actually going to be me. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Danich Roberts, and it is really a pleasure to be at my first ever council meeting. Over the next 
10 minutes, my colleague, Dr. Bao, and I will present our concept on education and training in social determinants of health, or SDOH, to advance health equity. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to present the background of the concept and then pass it on to Dr. Bao, who will talk about the purpose, the critical elements, and possible initiatives under this concept. Next slide, please. Um, that one, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so the first objective in the NIH-wide strategic plan is to provide support for research and educational and training activities that advance biomedical and behavioral sciences, specifically by understanding biological, behavioral, and social determinants of population health. Additionally, one of the key cross-cutting themes of the NIH's strategic plan is focused on institutes and centers providing support for research and education and training activities that are focused on improving minority health and reducing health disparities with the ultimate goal of promoting health equity. Next slide. At NINR, as you know, our mission is to lead nursing research to solve pressing health challenges and inform practice and policy, optimizing health and advancing health equity into the future. To accomplish this mission, NINR has identified five complementary and synergistic research lenses that best leverage the strengths of nursing research and promote multi-level approaches, cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral collaboration, and community engagement in research. These research lenses are health equity, population and community health, prevention and health promotion, systems and models of care, and social determinants of health. Next slide. As defined by the Healthy People 2030, SDOH are the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Some examples include job opportunities, housing, transportation, education, healthcare, income and wealth, the physical or built environment, as well as the policies and, sim and systems that influence the distribution of those resources. SDOH are closely tied to the wider set of economic, legal, political, regulatory, and cultural systems and forces, such as public and institutional policies, that shape the distribution of power, resources, and conditions of daily life across our society. SDOH have a greater influence on health than health behaviors, or clinical care, and play a central role in creating and sustaining health inequities. Many longstanding health inequities related to race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability have proven to be resistant to most individual level interventions. Therefore, more attention must be paid to the social conditions that impact health. These social conditions affect health across diseases and conditions population groups, and life course stages. They can impact health for better or for worse and span across many sectors, including economic, education, housing, and transit. The SDOH approach provides the framework and shared language needed to develop and expand rigorous research to address some of the seemingly intractable health inequities that exist across the US population. So innovative and rigorous research to clarify the mechanisms by which SDOH impact health, as well as to identify, implement, and disseminate effective approaches to address SDOH and to reduce and, lim and, and eliminate their inequities, uh, their inequitable distribution rather, is needed to reduce health disparities, advance health equity, and ultimately improve population health outcomes. However, SDOH has yet to receive a proportionate share of research attention, and that can be attributed, at least in part, to a lack of trained researchers. Uh, next slide, please. So SDOH-focused research is an essential part of any effort to address the most pressing health challenges we face in our country. If done well, 
this kind of research can help inform and improve the success of all other types of research designed to improve health. Nursing has long appreciated that health must be understood in the context of people's lives and living conditions. Nurses interact with individuals and families more closely than other health professionals in many clinical community and policy settings in which they work. Therefore, nurses really have a deep understanding of the personal and societal factors that lead to health among some and illness among others. SDOH research provides a framework to understand and intervene upon the health of the population with a critical emphasis on health equity. Numerous reports have identified the need for incorporating SDOH education in nursing curricula. However, and the, uh, the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 report has articulated the need for training in SDOH research. Specifically, as stated in the report, despite numerous calls for including equity, population health, and SDOH in nursing education, SDOH and related concepts are not currently well integrated into undergraduate and graduate nursing education. So considering this background, Dr. Bao will now talk us through the purpose of this concept. Next slide, please. So therefore, in, in, the light of, in light of this need, this initiative is intended to provide support for the development of educational and training opportunities that will expand the capacity of a diverse scientific workforce. One that is equipped to conduct rigorous and innovative solutions oriented nursing research to address SDOH and their systematic maldistribution on health and health equity. This would also be in alignment with the aforementioned NIH strategic goal of providing support for education and training activities that advance biomedical and behavioral sciences specifically related to social, social determinants of population health and NINR strategic goal of providing support for education and training of the next generation of nursing scientists who can understand and intervene on social determinants of health to inform policy and practice toward the long-term goal of eliminating health inequities. Next slide, please. The critical components of any of these possible funding initiatives would include the following related objectives. Number one, ensuring researchers have a strong foundational knowledge about the core concepts and theories that drive our current understanding about SDOH, as well as a solid understanding of the science upon which to build new knowledge. Advance. Also, to the training and the methods and tools needed to address critical gaps in the evidence of SDOH and their inequitable distribution across populations and effective solutions, as well as yes, increasing diversity in the workforce conducting SDOH research. Next slide, please. There are several types of potential funding initiatives that could be developed under this concept. First, a course, curriculum, or conference that is intended to expand the knowledge base and research skills in SDOH research. Uh, a second example might be an institutional educational and training program focused on SDOH research that engages communities in which, for example, a mentoring team includes a community partner and that would lay the groundwork for a career and community engaged SDOH research. And or an immersive summer SDOH education and training program at institutions with large proportions of their student body from populations underrepresented in nursing research. So for example, stemming from the, some of the discussion around Dr. Reed's presentation earlier, some support for possible uh, institutional R25 grants, uh, or, or 13 grants might be an opportunity for NINR to provide support to institutions to develop curricula, research activities, or expanded mentoring activities for nursing researchers that are conducting or will conduct SDOH-related research. Next slide, please. 
So as I wrap up, I would like to thank, we would like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Tarloff, the Director of the Division of Extramural Science Programs, for her work uh, with us on the development of this concept, and we thank you for your attention. We'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Do you mind kicking us off uh, with discussion? No, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for the opportunity to, um, yeah, start off the conversation. Uh, so so I, I love the concept. I, I, I love the plan of supporting increased focus on the social determinants of health. Uh, it feels like the uh, National Institute of Nursing Research is leading nursing back to its, its roots, where we belong, uh, thinking about community. So I love that. Uh, I think the uh, the framework provides a um, uh, a great way to intervene upon the health of the population, as described in the popular in, in the conversation, uh, with a critical emphasis on health equity. Um, and and I, I think this plan to provide support for the development of education and training opportunities is great. Um, and really thinking about um, you know a solutions oriented nursing research approach, really thinking about the maldistribution of uh, uh, on um, health and equity, really thinking about resources. And um, I really did not um, collaborate with Dr. Reed in advance of this, but where, where I see the opportunities are um, to really be intentional, and I think uh, Dr. Bao brought this up in his presentation, towards the end of the presentation, but to really be intentional about focusing on communities of of greatest disadvantage or greatest disinvestment. So the Rust Belt, the Mississippi Delta, uh, our tribal lands, our non-metropolitan communities, um, places in our social science, um, biomedical and philanthropic blind spots. Um, Schaefer and colleagues, I could share a paper if I haven't already, created an index of America's most disadvantaged communities, really thinking about income, um, life expectancy, and social mobility. And I think this really kind of converges on that, which I I think is really exciting. Um, and, and, and I think to Dr. Uh, Reed's point in his presentation, I, mean, I think we can really change the narrative by changing the narrators. Uh, it really would be great to, um, to target support towards uh, early career researchers from institutions with less capacity, less investment, uh, those minority serving institutions, those non-elite institutions that have experienced partnering in communities of deep disadvantage, deep disinvestment. Um, and so I think this, um, I think this focus it really aligns with what Dr. Reed brought up. So I think it's it's timely and it's it's really smart. And I'm just um, I'm really excited that that's the direction that NINR is thinking. So um, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Atkins. Um, other council members, would you like to weigh in? Dr. Lowe? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Danik Roberts and Dr. Bell for this great uh, presentation and um, very progressive thinking, forward thinking, and I think it's timely. Um, so I, I'm coming from a place where I think about um, the disparity of nurses in particular being Native American and having uh, across disciplines, there are less than 100 PhDs who are Native American in the US. And then in nursing, there are approximately maybe 25 of us and uh, maybe four of us have uh, programs of research that have been either currently funded or funded by NIH. And so we think about um, the gap, that as a gap, that as a disparity issue and inequity issue. And then we also think about that as um, how, do we, how do we move forward with uh, creating alternative and um, innovative strategies to be able to move the next generation of nurse scientists and especially native and indigenous nurse scientists. And so um, I have given great thought to, to this. And I think one of the um, 
one of the strategies could be that we create a way to be able to enhance nurse scientists who are underrepresented, especially from our group, who could be participate and uh, be supported in um, postdoctoral enhanced research training, especially around social determinants of health and and how that impacts um, health disparities and health inequities in our communities, but maybe in a very different way than the traditional postdoctoral mechanisms have been implemented. And that may be uh, through mechanisms that don't require uh, removing, replacing, moving away from, relocating away from, and going into uh, in a, an in an in residency program uh, at an institution that is far from home, where there is no relevancy to um, or application to the needs of that community, and which is where one would think the person would live and be a member of, or currently are a member of, and so it becomes much more relevant to stay there. So so I'm encouraged, and I would encourage also um, for us to think about mechanisms, funding mechanisms that um, may be on, you know, that was mentioned, like the R25, the T35. I know that there's been another mechanism, the T37s that have been, utilized. And um, so I would just encourage that. And so thank you for um, giving attention to this and the, and especially the, uh, being targeted with the focus. Thank you very much. Yeah, if, uh, if I could just add one of the things that we were also thinking as a possibility is funding an institution to perhaps host an annual meeting around SDOH research and developing uh, that annual meeting, providing in, in a vehicle, providing support for travel awards and scholarships for other researchers that, not, that are coming from less research intensive institutions or locations that could then have an opportunity to travel to that meeting every year, present some of their work, get mentoring and, and network with some researchers that they would not necessarily have access to uh, that uh, at their institution. So that would be one strategy uh, to bring, uh, to get some experiences that, that they can then take back to their own lab uh, or their own setting. Um, and the T35, uh, the summer intensive research program that you just mentioned, that could be also something that, uh, for example, a pre-doc could go gain some research experience and training experience for the summer and then take that back to them in their own research setting. Dr. Stone. Um, thank you. Um, I, I find this so, um, so innovative and such a needed opportunity. Um, and I like the idea, of, you know, coming from you know, one of the R1 universities at Columbia, we struggle with social determinants of health and we struggle supporting um, young scientists, emerging scientists from underrepresented minorities, you know, especially of color. And I, so this idea of bringing people together and gaining increasing networks and increasing knowledge across universities and, you know, um, supporting people at other universities or other settings. I mean, I, John, I hear you. Don't make people leave where they are, you know, but, bring, but bringing people to places where they can network and develop, you know, um, networks across settings, I think would be really, um, really beneficial. Pat. Other comments? All right. Well, Chris, Ristina, thank you so much for your work. Um, 
uh, council, thank you for that real that those really helpful thoughts and guidance. We so appreciate that. So we look forward to um, circling back to you on that. So um, we're going to move on to our uh, second presentation um, before the lunch break. So Dr. Uh, Shalanda Bynum, an NINR program officer, will present a concept on healthcare community linkages to advance health equity. Um, so following Dr. Bynum's presentation, council member Dr. John Lowe will offer comments to open up that discussion. So Dr. Bynum, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Zink. So good afternoon. Again, my name is Shalonda Bynum, and I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to present the concept Bridge to Care, focused on linking community organizations with healthcare organizations to more effectively address adverse health outcomes. Next slide. So my colleague nicely laid out the impact of social conditions on health. So I will reintroduce this topic just in brief for the purpose of this presentation. There is clear recognition that health is impacted by factors within and outside of the healthcare setting. These determinants, both the conditions in which people live and their individual and family circumstances encompass a broad range of factors such as those related to food, housing, and transportation all of which have profound and sustained influences on the ability of populations to realize their full health potential. The graphic here illustrates that social factors account for the largest variance in health outcomes. Combined with physical environment factors, this contribution is even higher. Uh, the last point that I want to communicate here is that marginalized populations, including racial and ethnic minorities groups and less privileged socioeconomic groups, bear an excess burden of unmet social needs and adverse social conditions, which create and perpetuate health disparities. Next slide, please. So given what has been discussed today about social factors, we know that healthcare is critical, but in isolation, insufficient to address the full range of determinants that influence health. As such, current systems and models of healthcare must be reimagined to make meaningful and sustained improvements in health as suggested by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. To more effectively accomplish this goal, healthcare community partnerships are emerging as critical to advancing health and health equity. Such partnerships better enable healthcare organizations to comprehensively address patient and community health by offering services and resources that are un otherwise unavailable within the healthcare context and more specifically the clinical setting. Innovating and reimagining how care is delivered in the role of healthcare organizations in addressing community health offers a greater opportunity to holistically meet the needs of individual patients, their families, and the communities that healthcare organizations serve. Next slide, please. So what we know is that a growing number of healthcare organizations have already implemented and incorporated social needs screening and referral into routine care. But this practice is less pronounced in low resource healthcare setting, is inconsistently implemented and does not demonstrate meaningful partnerships with community organizations uh, in efforts to better ensure that needs are met. There is also an opportunity for healthcare organizations to address community social conditions to make an even broader impact on improving health for the populations that they serve. Now for opportunity to meet reality and contextualizing the delivery of care for individuals and communities, gaps in scientific knowledge around implementation and effectiveness of social needs and social conditions interventions must be closed. 
to facilitate this, we need a larger body of evidence on the effectiveness of addressing social needs in healthcare settings. We need to expand understanding of best approaches to implementing programs to address social needs in low resource healthcare settings where a large proportion of patients experiencing adverse social circumstances might seek care. We need to cultivate meaningful clinical community partnerships to strengthen the ability of healthcare organizations to move beyond social need resource lists to increase coordination and provision of care. And lastly, we need additional research conducted in partnership with community and healthcare organizations to address social conditions within communities to broaden impact. Next slide, please. So a path forward bridge to care is intended to fill the scientific knowledge gaps just discussed by shifting focus from care that is solely focused on the prevention and treatment of disease and the medical model to one that advances health equity by addressing the adverse circumstances that limit the optimization, optimization of health. Next slide. So the overall purpose of Bridge to Care is to advance research that links clinical care with community services and resources to address unmet social needs of individuals and families and adverse social conditions in the community among populations experiencing health disparities across a broad range of conditions and diseases. Next slide, please. To fulfill the purpose of Bridge to Care, we propose three lines of research. At first, formative research to inform the development and implementation of interventions that bridge clinical care with community re resources. Uh, and this might include identifying best approaches for integrating social needs screening and service linkage into healthcare uh, systems, and identifying opportunities for healthcare organizations to work collaboratively with community organizations. Another line of research is intervention research conducted in partnership with healthcare and community organizations to address social needs at the individual or family level or social conditions at the community level. Lastly, we need research to understand the health impact of federal, tribal, state, local, or organizational policies and programs focused on addressing structural and social conditions as well as social needs. Bridge to Care proposes to fill these lines of research to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare organizations to uh, improve health among their um, pop the populations that they serve. Next slide. Thank you so much for listening and I welcome any questions. Shalanda uh, and John, feel free to proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Bynum. Um, the purpose of this concept is timely in response to NINR's strategic plan and vision for supporting science that advances the mission to solve pressing health challenges and inform practice and policy, optimizing health and advancing health equity into the future. There is a robust body of literature that elucidates how community structural, social, political, economic, and environmental conditions and context contribute to health inequities and the inability to attain optimal health. This concept will provide opportunities to address how social determinants of health requires a broad range of actions that involve collaboration of multiple sectors within communities. These include those who are on who are at the front lines of healthcare and are nonetheless important players and important and potential catalysts of change towards health equity for communities. Studies are needed that provide evidence of the impact of how well positioned healthcare entities can support individual family and community clients in dealing with social challenges, raise awareness of the human cost and suffering 
that results from issues such as poverty, discrimination, violence, and social exclusion, and advocate for better social conditions to reduce health inequities and for a re more responsive health care and social system to care for those in need. Missed opportunities to address health care needs of individuals within their social context have been identified as major factors leading to inefficiencies in healthcare delivery. Grant mechanisms are needed that not only support formative intervention and evaluation studies, but also those that support enhanced research training programs that prepares cohorts of nurse scientists with the ability to conceptualize and operationalize constructs of social determinants of health within the context of individuals, organizations, and systems within a community. This is particularly needed for populations such as racial and ethnic minority populations, less privileged socioeconomic status populations, underserved rural populations, and sexual and gender minority populations. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lowe. Council, other um, thoughts and reactions? Dr. Ayala. Um, well, if you don't know me by now, I'm screaming the joy um, because I love this initiative. So thank you, Lashanda. My name is Guadalupe Ayala. I go by Suchi. I'm at San Diego State University. Um, I've led a lot of multi-level, um, multi-sector interventions and the the potential to minimize diffusion of responsibility in this among people who have control over situations is so wonderful with these bridging and kind of sectorial type approaches. So, and also the potential to reduce miscommunication in terms of what people hear as well for what they need to do. So just congratulations. You have a lot of work ahead of you, but this is just amazing. I do have one question though, one comment. Um, so I have the privilege of working with some nurses on a new clinical health equity, uh, clinical research network for health equity. And part of what they're trying to do is, is build a research department within um, a hospital in a rural setting. And one of the things I was really struck with was uh, nursing, the nursing researchers, their understanding of fidelity. Like I've worked with a lot of researchers, but fidelity to treatment, they really get. And so just even after one discussion of process evaluation and how we need to ensure that what is being delivered in this pragmatic trial is actually being delivered, like they got it. And like two days later, they're already sending me process evaluation data. How is it, how can we build in that potential more work in that? Because I think that NINR, just from the experience with a few people that are fairly junior researchers and their attraction and understanding to that, how can we build that? Because we definitely need that in other areas of health promotion, public health research. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Suchi, for those comments and your question. Um, so coming from a public health background, evaluation is embedded, right? So you have your impact outcome and process evaluation. Um, so I think it definitely for this, that that's particularly important in terms of uh, kind of building the evidence base. So we need to know uh, what works, what doesn't work, and adjust along the way. So I, I, in, in terms of evaluation, that will be embedded within that piece that um, hopefully will we'll play out in review. But I agree, that's an important part of it and often missed. Um, and so folks focused on um, kind of outcome evaluation, but understanding how the program works uh, and how it doesn't work, it, it's important as well. Thank you. So Dr. Bynum, I just want to um, provide some commentary. I'm obviously in strong favor of the concept. I love the deterring of the bridges too and providing opportunities to, to develop some fundamental work all the way to evaluation. And I, I think what this helps overcome is the extensive and enduring fragmentation of healthcare delivery or viewing as healthcare being it's separate from the care of people where they are and live and um, have a great privilege of working in a city where there's some of the best healthcare in the world. But a lot of participants leave from exemplary healthcare right back into food insecurity for themselves and families and, and other just dire circumstances. So 
any opportunities that really stem from this concept that um, that helped bridge some of that, I think is absolutely phenomenal. So strongly in favor of this initiative and thanks so much for bringing it, bringing it to our, our council's attention. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for those um, comments. So yeah, that's it's kind of the, 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 the scientific premise of this, that we know that health is impacted by several different factors, but um, healthcare organizations who are now incorporating kind of social needs screening isn't doing it in a very effective way. Um, but it, in order for programs to be sustained, in order for policy to be informed, we need the evidence and uh, we need rigorous research and to be able to inform um, sustainability and, and policy change at the organizational level, state level, local level, et cetera. Thank you for that. So I have a question, Dr. Bynum, um, about nurse-led clinics. We know that there are nurse-led clinics in this country that are out in the community. And I think some of the, one of the gaps is really looking at nurse scientists working closely with those nurse-led clinics. Any thoughts on making that part of perhaps an objective? So you mean nurse-led clinics in terms of partnerships? Yes, yes. Uh, there's some FQs that are nurse led uh, and any alignment within a college of nursing with nurse scientists that would really promote this kind of work. Yeah, so uh, we, as the concepts move forward, we are definitely interested in, um, I mean, academic, so it will be multi-sectorial, right? So we need um, the academic researchers, um, folks within healthcare systems, and so folks within um, the uh, community organizations. And we conceptualize healthcare organizations very broadly. Um, so it can be your traditional um, kind of hospital systems or federally qualified health centers. So it can be a, a anywhere in which uh, care, healthcare is received. So that's how healthcare organizations is conceptualized broadly. And we do see um, kind of several different um, players being important for this type of concept specifically. Great, thank you. If I can do a follow-up question. Um, so do you envision that the evidence would be gathered first and then from the evidence it would provide information to be informative to where maybe there needs to be remediation training etc or do you think the evidence is there that there is a gap and that maybe training needs to you know be part of the process for addressing um, this issue thank you yeah, thank you, Dr. Lowe, for that question. Um, so I think we need more evidence. So I see it as kind of your first statement. So building the evidence to inform organ organizational change or local change uh, in terms of policies and programs. So building the evidence to be able to inform how um, hospital systems, clinics, et cetera, operate. Um, and it, it, I would imagine that there would need to be some training and other things going on within systems of care to be able to um, effectively implement kind of at the organizational level change. But we need the evidence to say, hey, this is working uh, and we need this to continue. So find what works and then inform um, change or push for change. So it's hard for someone to argue if this is working and improving health that it shouldn't be widely implemented. Any other comments as we wrap up? Okay, thank you, Shalanda. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone uh, for weighing in there and um, contributing those uh, ideas. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, made it uh, to our lunch break. So it is 1.10 Eastern. Um, how about we reconvene at 1.50 Eastern? So that's uh, 40 minutes from now. 
Any uh, concerns about that, council members? I see some thumbs up. Uh, any thumbs down? Okay, no thumbs down. I don't see any so far. All right, well, let's go with it. Let's. Uh, I'll see you at, in 40 minutes at 1.50. Thank you so much. Welcome back. It is 1.50. Thank you for those who have turned on your camera. Oh, now I see so many more. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Great. Elizabeth, looks like we're doing well with people reconvening. All right, awesome. I think everybody is mostly back, so thanks for that. So welcome back. As I mentioned um, in my director's update, the issue of firearm injury prevention will be our first strategic imperative for the Institute. So to provide context on how others in federal research are addressing this issue, we'll hear from colleagues at NIH and the CDC. So um, we're going to start with Dr. Christina Hunter. Is uh, Christine on? I am. Hi. Hey, Christine. Welcome. Um, so let me give you an introduction, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Um, so Dr. Hunter is acting uh, dir director for behavioral and social sciences research, and um, oh, I think I got that wrong. Sorry, Christine. Let me start again. Uh, okay, Dr. Hunter is the Acting Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and Acting Director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. In these roles, she supports OBSSR mission to enhance the impact of health-related behavioral and social sciences research, coordinate and integrate these sciences into the larger NIH research enterprise, and communicate health-related behavioral and social sciences research findings. Christine is also a captain in the U.S. Public Health Service. So I will turn uh, the meeting over to Dr. Hunter as she gives us an overview of NIH research support on firearm injury and mortality prevention. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen. Hopefully that's good. Somebody will pipe up if it's not. Sounds good. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you to provide a brief overview of the NIH research support for firearms injury and mortality prevention research. Um, so let me first start with a bit of information about our office um, and uh, the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research and why we're coordinating this effort. So we sit in the um, uh, Office of the Director and we're in the Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives. And for our office, we're really always thinking about things that we um, can be engaged in that focus on the integration of behavioral and social science across uh, in, uh, the NIH, uh, focused on coordination and collaboration with the institutes and centers on cross-cutting high-priority behavioral and social science uh, research across the NIH, help to identify and address critical challenges that are barriers to advancement in the field, and focus on challenges that our office is uniquely positioned to address. And I think, um, you know, firearms injury and mortality prevention certainly uh, applies to many institutes and centers, but is really a cross-cutting issue. So it's a nice area for our office to focus on. Um, so I think uh, hopefully we can all agree that firearm violence in the U.S. is an urgent public health crisis um, with really too many alarming health-related statistics to review here in this brief presentation, but I do want to highlight a few. In 2020, 79% of all homicides and 53% of all suicides involve firearms. Between 2019 and 2020, firearm homicide rates increased by 35%. It's the highest in over 25 years. In 2020, for ages 1 through 19, firearm-related injuries became the leading cause of death. And there's large disparities that exist by race, ethnicity, and poverty, significantly impacting African Americans and um, uh, Alaskan uh, Indians and, uh, and Native Alaskan populations. Also, non-fatal injury and witnessing violent uh, victimization increases risk for acute and chronic physical or mental health um, conditions. Um, the NIH has been uh, and remains committed to supporting scientific research to advance um, uh, the, our understanding and prevent firearms violence and injury uh, and mortality. 
Um, so this graphic is just to show some of the most prevalent keywords. This is using uh, RCDC um, in the research space in the last few years. So it's it only includes new award awards. It's uh, both firearm specific funding opportunities and others, um, but it doesn't include uh, the uh, FY22 uh, network funding, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, so. As I noted, NIH has always funded some research um, in this area, and these three associated funding opportunities were issued in uh, fiscal year 13 and expired in fiscal year 17. Um, they focused on health determinants, consequences of violence, and prevention of firearms violence. There were over 125 publications from these awards. And these grants uh, listed here are just some examples, but it was really a range of things, looking at alcohol, drug, and other prior crimes and risk of arrest, looking at psychological and socio-contextual factors in gun carrying and firearm violence, and thinking about exposure to violence and subsequent weapons use. More examples was a randomized trial of abandoned housing remediation, substance abuse, and violence, building resilient neighborhoods and positive social networks um, in an effort to prevent gun violence, and thinking about interagency database linkage um, to really better understand precursors of firearm injury uh, and suicide. Um, some more examples of awards that come from a range of uh, uh, types of funding opportunities, so IC-led funding opportunities that included things that had a general focus on violence, injury prevention, or suicide prevention, investigator-initiated work, or NIH-wide uh, related efforts, such as the transformative um, health disparities or structural racism initiatives. So as you can see, again, a real range of topics, everything from firearm safety, short and long-term impacts of childhood exposure to violence, focusing modifying social determinants of health to reduce uh, uh, injury and mortality, um, focusing on racism, firearm injury risks and resiliency, and then thinking about other novel approaches like uh, research on trusted residents and housing assistance um, to decrease violence exposure. Um, so in FY20, uh, Congress appropriated funds for firearms injury and mortality prevention research, and this appropriations provided $12.5 million um, of funding to both the CDC and the NIH. And so this funding is continued into fiscal 23, and it continues to be $12.5 million a year. And the goal is to conduct research on firearm injury and mortality prevention by taking a comprehensive approach to studying the underlying causes and evidence-based methods of prevention um, of firearm injury, and this includes crime prevention. The congressional language requires that the research must be ideologically and politically unbiased, that no funds can be used to advocate or promote gun control, and that grantees are required to fill a range of requirements around open data, pre-registration, et cetera. So related to the appropriations in fiscal years uh, 2020 and 2021, we issued these uh, funding opportunities, two-year pilot R61 awards, competitive supplements, three-year R01 awards, um, and pilot R21, R33 awards. And you can see uh, the numbers and the institutes listed here. And in these funding opportunities, we really took that broad public health approach, including breadth and emphasis, so such as thinking about um, research in healthcare and community settings, focus on multi-level considerations. Um, we focused both on victimization and perpetration risk. Um, we focused on a wide range of types of violence uh, and populations, so everything from suicide, youth violence, childhood injury, intimate partner violence, uh, justice involved, and then in terms of populations, included a breadth of populations, and these are just some examples. Justice involved individuals, people with Alzheimer's and related dementia, um, and, uh, and a variety of uh, populations that experience disparities. Um, in terms of types of research, we also wanted to foc on, focus on um, a range of types of research, so risk and protective factors um, at multiple levels but also really moving the field towards developing and pilot testing innovative programs to screen and prevent uh, for, firearm, for <clears throat> firearm injury and mortality. 
And again, just want to cover sample awards, won't read everything here, but it is a nice range of thinking about, you know, upstream suicide prevention, um, encouraging through encouraging safe firearm storage, um, alcohol restrictions and firearm prohibitions based on mental illness, understanding uh, the effects of that. Um, looking at the mechanisms underlying the association of firearm availability and vulnerability to suicide. Um, thinking about evaluation of burnout prevention, um, of a burnout prevention program for staff in a gun violence prevention program, state policies on maternal mortality, um, and thinking about one year after firearms injury uh, among children and uh, their emergency use, emergency room use um, in the US. And you can see at the bottom, there's a full list of awards at this link. So if you really want to dive into what the, uh, the portfolio has been from these funding opportunities, um, that's a good place to look. Last year and this year, um, we are, uh, and there's open uh, funding opportunities that you can see at the bottom of uh, the slide. We emphasize the funding of a network of research projects that will really develop and test prospective interventions at the community or community organization level. We really felt that was um, an important next step to go in, in NIH support in this research area. Another thing that we feel is really um, important and novel is we are requiring community partners as key personnel. So this is more than in just engaged research. This is uh, truly active partners from the get-go, and we believe this will be ex uh, essential for success. You can see the participating institute centers and offices listed here. Really, it's quite a widespread of uh, the NIH, and uh, it's been a great team to work with. We um, also had a uh, funded a coordinating center that's going to act as the data and communication research for the network in the field. And these were the uh, sites that were funded in fiscal year 2022, the coordinating center at the University of Michigan, and three uh, research project sites in Chicago, uh, uh, DC, and Mississippi. Um, <clears throat> In addition, and then with this, with the fiscal year 23 uh, funding opportunity, we're hoping to really grow the research project. So we're very excited to see that network extended and expanded. Um, in addition to the research network FOAs, we also coordinated the issuance of a few other violence and firearms uh, funding opportunities, not, not directly tied to the appropriations funding. So this funding opportunity that you see here focused on increasing the understanding of identifying uh, those at risk for firearm injury, again, developing, piloting, and testing innovative interventions to prevent injury and mortality, um, and then moving upstream to examine approaches to improve the implementation of existing evidence-based prevention interventions. Um, and again, you'll see broad inclusion of various settings and uh, populations with an emphasis on multi-level cross-sector partnerships where appropriate. Um, and one of the exciting things about this FOA is it allowed for increased integration of more targeted institute and center priorities and outcomes. So it really helps to grow uh, the NIH portfolio um, beyond the appropriations driven funding opportunities. So we really have greater breadth and depth in uh, the field um, at moving forward. Another funding opportunity um, is an example where it the focus is violence, it includes firearms violence, and it's looking at the effects on health outcomes, uh, as well as the integration of violence-related screening uh, and interventions into healthcare settings. And so violence is uh, broadly defined, as you can see here. Healthcare settings is also broadly designed, defined as any organization where patients go to get physical or behavioral health care. So it's everything from federally qualified health centers, community or school-based clinics, primary care, VA facilities, HIV clinics, and on and on. Um, and uh, again, really excellent institute center and office um, uh, participation, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. So through our office, we'll continue to pursue coordinate and co <clears throat> coordination and development of new research activities in a cross NIH way. Um, we're going to lean heavily on this NIH-wide uh, uh, 
violence working group and this working group is co-led by staff from our office OBSSR and uh, NICHD. Um, we believe that NIH wide coordination will remain really important in this space but we're also very excited to see this work um, move into increased kind of IC-led, IC-specific initiatives uh, such as in NINR. Um, we really feel that this is the way to grow the field in a meaningful way, make sure that there's research that's, that's relevant to the specific IC missions um, and grow the capacity in the field. Um, other <clears throat> uh, violence research coordinate coordination activities, excuse me, that you might be interested in. Um, the paper at the top bullet here is one that you might be uh, interested in looking in, looking at. It highlights some future directions for research, um, and it's in translational behavioral medicine. Um, there's also an increasing recognition of the role of violence in health-related outcomes. Um, and I think the increased focus on structural racism and a broader interest in social determinants of health uh, really brings together uh, uh, important new directions for research, research at the NIH uh, in, this, in this space. Um, the IMPROVE initiative uh, focused on maternal mortality and the transformative health disparities program um, include investigator-initiated projects focused on violence, so again, really extending uh, the reach of the portfolio at NIH and the opportunities for important research. And then I'm excited. We uh, believe that we need future, pri um, uh, future focus on capacity building and training support, uh, particularly for PIs from traditionally underrepresented populations. And as of yesterday, we successfully published two uh, K-18 funding opportunity uh, announcements. Um, so we're really excited to be able to get things launched in that space as well. And then our priori priority is going to be ongoing collaboration both within the uh, NIH and also our collaboration with CDC and the National Institutes of Justice and other federal partners to be sure that there's not duplication, that there's synergy, um, and that we are staying coordinated and informed of each other's efforts. And so with that, again, uh, at the bottom uh, of the screen, you can see OBSSR Violence Research Initiatives. That's where you can get a lot more details. Click on links, go to the reporter links um, if you want to see specific aims on the various um, initiatives. And with that, I will stop sharing and take questions. Thanks, Christine. Um, so I've asked Dr. Monroe to help lead us in discussion. Uh, Cindy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start out by really saying thank you, Dr. Hunter, for that really excellent presentation. Uh, firearm violence, I think, is of great concern to the American public. It's of concern to healthcare providers, and it's a broader concern to the scientific community. And it's an issue that affects every area of our lives. But as you noted, it has a substantial impact on the health of the nation, and it is related to health disparities. So understanding the underlying causes and the multi-level risk factors is key to developing interventions to prevent firearm injury and mortality, and those effective interventions are desperately needed. I am really grateful that Congress appropriated funds specifically for research on firearm injury and mortality prevention. I am also really grateful for your leadership and for the cooperation among multiple NIH institutes. I noted that NINR has participated in the FOAs and is among the institutes that's involved in the current notice of special interest on research on addressing violence to improve health outcomes. So there are directions for NINR. And NINR has also offered a workshop in November of 22 on firearm injury prevention, state of the science and the potential of nurse-led research. So I think NINR and the nursing community have much to contribute to the prevention of firearm injury and mortality. Continuing the trajectory of this research is critically important. Adequate funding, strong leadership, cooperation across NIH institutes and among the CDC and other federal agencies will be necessary to move this research forward. And I am heartened by seeing all of those essential components in place. So this question may be best uh, addressed after Dr. Simon's presentation, 
but I'd be interested in you telling us more about the current and planned interagency collaborations, particularly the collaboration with the CDC. Sure, thank you. Yes, NINR is doing some really uh, wonderful things in this space, and there is absolutely um, exciting roles for uh, uh, for nursing science to really advance what we know and interventions in this field. So in terms of collaboration, I mean, I think we're doing it on multiple levels. So we stay regularly connected with our CDC colleagues and our NIJ colleagues. Um, and again, it's really focused on making sure that the research that each agency is supported is not we're not duplicating each other's efforts, um, that there's synergy in the efforts. It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some sh some similarities because the needs remain the same, whether the funds are from the CDC or the NIH or NIJ, um, but really trying to keep, keep abreast of what each other's doing. Um, we also um, are involved in multiple um, uh, White House and OSTP groups um, that have interagency representatives focused on everything from gender-based violence, school safety, um, policing, social determinants of health. So I think that there, there are opportunities um, for us to um, engage with lots of federal agencies about what's happening in this space on different levels. So at least in that that uh, realm, I feel like we're doing a pretty decent job of being connected with with various agencies. That's not always the case, but in this in this space, I think it's pretty good. Good. And then I'm interested in the idea that there are some opportunities that are not funded by the the special appropriation. Are those also subject to the same constraints of the appropriation report language? Not quite as directly. So, I mean, in terms of the appropriation, we really try to be very um, uh, specific about what the pri primary aims are. So, the primary aims really need to be firearms, injury, and mortality prevention. And you heard me say that a lot because we really stay very focused on that. I think, you know, being um, uh, politically unbiased and ideologically unbiased would remain important across all of the NIH funding. Um, but one of the things that that when we're focusing on funding opportunities outside of the appropriations that I think is exciting, is then we really can weave in specific games that are about substance use or diseases and, you know, and, it, and really get at some of those other target outcomes uh, as primary as well. So, and it, and it does, it, it we are so happy with the appropriation. So, but I don't think we want for our efforts to be limited to that. We think that there's a lot to be done and that this really ties into a number of the IC missions. And so I think this is our opportunity to grow um, a, a broader range that includes appropriated funds, but also um, regular NIH funds. Thanks. Um, I think Dr. Johnson has his hand up. To him. I, I do. Um, I, thank you very much, Dr. Hunter, for that excellent presentation. And the um, it's great to see the momentum building in this area. Um, I wanted to just um, um, comment on the appropriations a bit more. And at first blush, it was very exciting, to, you know, 12.5 million. And then I zoomed, mentally zoomed out, zoomed back and thought, okay, this is the leading cause of death in ch children and adolescents. 12 point, when I think about it through that lens, 12.5 million seems like a tiny drop in a bucket. And so I just, I didn't know um, if you had comments on the, um, on the scale of the appropriations, if that you, you were excited about it, and as am I, but in terms of what we think is needed to really get at the complicated um, sets of issues that result in this, you know, this this being the leading cause of death in this group. Um, am I um, being too critical when I think that that's a tiny, um, that that's a small response? It's, I don't want to rain on the uh, progress, but um, it just seems um, not huge. So maybe I will answer your question, not necessarily by commenting on whether on the congressional appropriation, but I think that to your point, it's exactly why I wanted to highlight the fact that we actually have been funding work in this area prior to these appropriations, and that this is a nice 
sort of seeding launching point to really engage multiple IC partners, think about where they want to be in this space, make sure we're working together across the NIH. And, and just as you're going to hear today, and you heard from Dr. Zink, think about where, you know, non-appropriated funds can be committed in this area. So I don't really see it as the stopping point. I see it as a starting point. Does that make sense? That does. Thank you. That's so that's encouraging. Thanks. Dr. Ayala. Um, thank you. This was a great presentation. It's an area that research wise I'm less familiar with. So it was great to kind of understand where investments are being made. I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit more about the types of community partners with some of the um, FOAs you have out there, because I, in reflecting on the social determinants discussion, we and I work in obesity, um, and so we know that there's a lot of of related <laughs> determinants on both of these issues. So, what what types of partners might these individuals be working with? So in the funding opportunities, it's pretty broad. To be frank, I can't really detail for you what the community partners are in the network, but I think that we are interested in a range of, uh, it, so it could be, uh, you know, child and youth programs that are operating in the community. It could be uh, community-based um, uh, efforts in kind of reintegrating after incarceration. It could be, you know, it, 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 it could, we are, what we want are those people that are on the ground that are working with populations that, that, that know the needs to address and be partners in whatever the research uh, intervention is and defining what the research intervention should be, how we should engage. And so, you know, if you look at the, the uh, network projects uh, that are uh, funded, I mean, I think there's, there are ones involved in ER, one's uh, uh, looking I at- I saw one was hospital-based, right? Yeah, one's hospital-based, one right, right. And so it's, it's. Uh, so now I'm just rambling because I don't know the exact details. No, but I that's do, okay. I, no, I do know the intent know. Is, Thank you. Is, is really to have um, broad community partners and, and de that's defined pretty wide. Any other questions or thoughts for Dr. Hunter? Okay. Oh, can I? all right. Thank Hi. you. Thank you, Dr. Zeng. Uh, so I too am pretty pleased um, to see again the breadth and the scope and, and the um, understanding that this is a cross-cutting issue. And, and I really do believe this is going to fill important gaps in firearm injury prevention. You know, especially for purposes as we develop these models of cares, we're developing uh, models that include these um, social determinants of health. And, and I'm reminded, you know, Dr. Satcher and I had a really great conversation about how this is an issue that is all of our issues. Because I had, I too, Dr. Ayala had said, this isn't really my area of expertise. And he says, it should be all of our expertise. It impacts everything that we do. And, and I remember over the years, we were trying to get the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, to rate um, um, basically gun violence counseling and research, uh, gun violence counseling and interventions as an A or B. We're having trouble there um, getting them to see the evidence. They said there was a dearth of evidence. So I do believe that this is going to be critical in filling that gap, um, especially in communities that have been disproportionately affected. So I'm just curious, you know, what you all intend to do um, to, uh, to ensure that there is a connection between the work that is done and these other agencies that are operationalizing health equity. Excellent point, and I, I completely agree. So we have the Office of Disease Prevention here at NIH, and um, they are regularly coordinating with both um, the CDC's Community Guide but and the U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force. Um, so, so I think that those links are kind of easily made between the research that we're conducting. Um, but your point, I think, is also well taken that for a lot of years, I think the most prevalent research was kind of 
understanding of observational trials, and we absolutely need observational trials and really understand what are the risks and causes and, you know, look at that longitudinally, but we also critically need to build the portfolio of prevention and intervention research as well. And so that's, you know, that's why we've been moving into the community-based networks um, for the last two years. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions for Dr. Hunter? Well, thank you, Christine, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for your really thoughtful discussion. I appreciate you being here, Christine. Thanks for having me. So let's do a check and see. I do see uh, Dr. Simon, so we will move on to our CDC partner and perspective. Um, so, as I said, Dr. Thomas Simon uh, will present to us on the work uh, the CDC has done around firearm injury prevention. Dr. Simon is the Senior Director for Scientific Programs in the Division of Violence Prevention at CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. He provides leadership on scientific policy, research methodology, and priorities for research activities. His work focuses primarily on violence involving young people and the linkages across different forms of violence. He is particularly interested in how changes in prevention strategies and policies can reduce risk for multiple types of violence at the population level. So Dr. Simon, thanks so much for being here today. Please feel free to proceed. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to the council for inviting me here today to speak. Um, I was very pleased to learn about your initiative, and I'm very happy to share some information about our research and related activities um, relevant to firearm injury prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So as you all are well aware, firearm injuries are a significant public health problem that affects thousands of people, families, schools, and communities every year. Um, this past year, CDC released a new vital signs report. It was actually our first vital signs on firearm injury and violence prevention um, and related inequities. And Christine shared some of the results. I'll just add that um, the most recent data from CDC's vital statistics surveillance system indicate that there's over 57 lives lost to firearm homicide every day and over 72 lives lost to firearm suicide every day. In that vital signs report and a subsequent MMWR article, we documented an unprecedented 35% increase in firearm homicides between 2019 and 2020 in the COVID context. And we then saw an 8% increase in both firearm homicide and firearm suicide in 2021. As a result of these increases, the firearm homicide and firearm suicide rates in 2021 were the highest we've seen in the United States since 1993 and 1990, respectively. We also documented and described long-standing disparities that have widened um, during this time period, with particularly high firearm homicide rates among young Black males, and that gap is widening. And we're talking about these issues. It's really important um, to avoid contributing to harmful narratives. And so we're really intentionally trying to articulate the fact that social and structural conditions, including economic conditions, education, housing conditions, and access to services are all associated with risk for homicide and suicide. They drive these disparities and inequities, and the COVID-19 pandemic could have worsened these conditions, especially in some racial and ethnic communities. Next slide, please. So at CDC, our goal is to prevent firearm injuries and violence, to save lives and make communities safer. Um, we do this by providing the best data possible to inform action, by conducting and funding research to identify effective solutions, and by disseminating the best available information and promoting collaboration across sectors to prevent violence. And I'll touch on each of these elements in my comments today. Next slide, please. So as Christine mentioned, in fiscal year 2020, Congress appropriated $12.5 million to both CDC and IH to conduct research on firearm injury and mortality prevention. Um, the funding is to examine both the underlying causes of firearm injury, deaths, and crime, as well as identify evidence-based prevention approaches. As Christine mentioned, this really 
was landmark funding for us. It was the first time in 20 years that CDC received dedicated funding for firearm injury prevention. Next slide, please. So the new appropriations allowed us to release funding opportunities that just would not have been possible otherwise. We used the funds to issue two R01 research grant announcements in 2020. Um, well, actually, the first was in 2020, and um, it supported 16 awards. The second one was just released this past year and supported four new awards. And I'll share that. In each announcement, we provided two fairly broad funding options. Um, funding option A is for projects that rely on existing data and do not support implementation of prevention activities. These projects were funded for up to $350,000 per year for up to two years. And the second funding option is for projects that do require support for new data collection or for the implementation of prevention activities. And these projects could be funded at a higher amount, up to $650,000 per year and for a longer period, up to three years. Next slide, please. So the funding announcements included two broad objectives. They supported research to improve our understanding of firearm-related injury across different types of firearm incidents, so more etiologic types of research, or research to identify effective strategies to keep individuals, families, schools, and communities safe, so more evaluation research. And in our funding opportunity announcements, we highlight how these objectives align with the published research priorities that were released by the Institute of Medicine in collaboration with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, I'll share that interest in these funding announcements has been substantial. In both years, we received more applications than we could fund. This really underscores the importance of the topic and the number of strong ideas that are out there just waiting for support. Um, when we look, take a step back and look across the projects that we funded, um, they really do represent a good mix across the research objectives and geography and populations. Next slide, please. So I thought I would just briefly summarize the types of studies that we funded and provide a couple examples. Um, several of the funded studies focus on understanding risk and protective factors across a, a range of topics to inform prevention. Um, these include research on factors influencing gun-related attitudes, behaviors, access, caring, and safety practices, risk and protective factors related to different forms of firearm-related injury, and research on neighborhood-level exposures and related factors. Each of the studies, of course, are designed to address specific gaps. Um, in terms of an ex first example, um, most people who die by suicide do see a healthcare provider sometime in the year prior to death. This gives clinical providers an important opportunity to intervene with patients at risk for firearm suicide. However, there is relatively little evidence available to guide implementation of promising clinical practices for firearm suicide prevention. And one of the studies that we're funding is being conducted by Dr. Julie Richards at Kaiser Foundation Hospitals. She and her team are collecting patient, clinician, and leader perspectives on clinical practices for identifying and engaging individuals at risk of firearm suicide. And they're identifying opportunities for practice improvement, and then they're going to pilot test intervention strategies in three healthcare systems. The results are going to hopefully help address the need for patient-centered strategies to identify and engage patients at risk of firearm suicide. Another study I wanted to mention is being led by Dr. Jason Goldstick at the University of Michigan, and that team is validating the safety clinical screening tool they're going to examine the ability to predict youth firearm violence involvement within the subsequent year and work to improve the predictive success of the tool. We're excited about this because the results could inform future research and assessments focused on identifying the youth most in need of intervention. Next slide, please. So other studies are rigorously evaluating a range of prevention approaches. These include hospital-based interventions, bystander approaches, interventions to enhance safety during times of acute crises, and firearm safety interventions to reduce unintentional injuries among children, just to give you a sense of the diversity of topics. Um, 
These studies are looking at multiple behavioral and injury outcomes, including unintentional suicide and assault-related intents. Um, and I wanted to share some hospital-based violence intervention programs because these have really become increasingly popular because of their success at engaging individuals at risk, but there's a lot of um, research gaps that need to be addressed. So I'll just mention a couple. Dr. Um, Dr. Patrick Carter and his team are evaluating the INT-ER Act intervention, which is designed to reduce risk behaviors and fire and violence among youth seeking treatment in urban emergency departments. It's really interesting in that the study uses behavioral therapy sessions, tailored messages, and a really unique and innovative approach involving GPS notifications when youth enter areas that they've pre-identified as having put them at risk for firearm violence. So the study is going to determine not only the effectiveness in terms of reducing risk for violence, but also the cost benefits of the intervention and the potential for broader public health impact. Another study is focused specifically on adults. Dr. Nicholas Thompson and the team at Virginia Commonwealth University are conducting a randomized controlled trial to evaluate an intervention called Bridging the Gap, or BTG, that includes a, a hospital-based violence intervention, a fire and counseling program, and six months of community case management for victims of violence. The study will also include a cost-benefit analysis to determine the economic benefits, um, and the results are going to help, we hope, to determine the effectiveness of BTG as a firearm-related violence intervention for adult victims of violence. Next slide, please. So I thought I would share that in addition to these more standard grant opportunity announcements, we've also supported two awards for new investigators. This funding supports a mentored research experience. And our goal here is to really help build the next generation of firearm violence prevention researchers. We feel like there's uh, a gap that still needs to be addressed given the, the lack of um, resources for this kind of research for so long. Um, one of the funded projects is developing a social media intervention that can enhance street outreach programs to reduce cyber banging, uh, which has been implicated in youth firearm violence. The second project is describing programs and policies across neighborhoods in Cleveland, Ohio, and Detroit, Michigan, to identify neighborhood-level exposures that are most predictive of youth firearm violence and suicide. Next slide, please. So the last research activity that I wanted to share is that we just recently released two new funding announcements for fiscal year 23. Um, essentially, we separated out the two objectives and provided multiple additional examples. So one of the announcements focuses more specifically on ideologic questions to inform prevention activities to reduce firearm-related violence, injuries, death, or crime, um, specifically within populations or settings experiencing elevated risk. And the second is to support rigorous evaluations of innovative and promising strategies to prevent firearm-related violence and injuries. And we really, in these NOFAs, we highlight the importance of looking at um, strategies for different populations, including children, active duty military and veterans, rural tribal populations, and those at risk of harming themselves or others. We talk about the importance of looking across different settings. Um, neighborhood, community settings, um, rural urban settings that can be leveraged to prevent firearm-related injuries and crime, um, as well as looking at um, a range of individual, peer, community, and societal risk and protective factors. And we really try to emphasize the need to um, evaluate strategies that address social and structural conditions that contribute to racial, ethnic inequities and risk for firearm violence. And both of these NOFOs are still on the street. Um, they're closing on February 16th. So we're looking forward to hopefully getting a good response to those as well. Next slide, please. So I thought I would put these um, research-related initiatives in a slightly broader context. I wanted to mention that we are also using some of the firearms funding to support um, advancements in surveillance. And I thought you might be interested in our firearm surveillance through emergency rooms or FASTER initiative. Um, while we've got great mortality surveillance, information on non-fatal firearm injuries has been a bit more challenging. The FASTER initiative uses the National Syndromic Surveillance Platform, which is, you know, designed to develop, designed to detect outbreaks. Um, we're currently supporting 10 state health departments to provide surveillance data. Essentially, it's in near real time. 
on emergency department visits for non-fatal injuries. The funding also facilitates um, the dissemination of findings to key local partners working to prevent or respond to firearm injuries. Next slide, please. And as Christine mentioned, you know, in the limited time that we have today, I've also only provided a high level overview of some of the most relevant research initiatives and surveillance activities. Um, all the studies that I've mentioned and the NOFOs are available described on our website, um, which is which is shown here. Um, we've also got information on the page um, related to our surveillance projects, um, key definitional issues, statistics and consequences, and a range of resources too. Next slide. I also just wanted to emphasize, you know, the importance of doing this research is to drive data to action. And um, I wanted to mention that we just, we really focus on the urgency preventing firearm related violence and we're committed to putting research evidence into the hands of the public and to inform prevention. Um, when available, our findings are shared through a variety of channels, our website, social media. Um, we've also worked to develop a series of what we've called technical packages. Um, and there's, those are shown on these slides, this slide here. Um, we just recently expanded the, what was a suicide technical package is now the suicide prevention resource for action. And what each of these technical packages do is describe um, the best available evidence for taking action now based on research. Um, and they describe the approaches, um, examples of specific programs, policies, or practices, and what's known about the evidence for them. And then we also, you know, promote the research results and these um, evidence-based strategies through our programmatic initiatives, um, like the Comprehensive Suicide Prevention Program and uh, an initiative called PREVAIL, which stands for Preventing Violence Affecting Young Lives. And those initiatives are also described on our website. So next slide. I just wanted to end by, you know, saying we're committed to helping move the field forward through innovative research and surveillance to inform the development of new prevention strategies. Um, while the grantees that we've supported are still finishing their projects, we are starting to see some findings and we're expecting to see quite a bit more in the coming year and beyond. Um, certainly, as we start, as you guys were starting to talk about before I joined, um, there's so much work to do. Um, we're excited to have the council working to help advance research on firearm injury prevention, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Simon, for joining us and for that presentation. So I've asked Dr. Becca Meyer uh, to help lead us in discussion. So Betty, floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much for, for having me, and I hope my internet connection works okay. I've been having some problems, so... I'll take myself off the video if need be. But um, but thank you for the Dr. Simon and also Dr. Hunter. I mean, the I'm thrilled about this area of research. It has so much relevance to nursing science. And and I always think in terms of where we can make our biggest impact from an upstream per, um, perspective. So I think about how this um, relates so much to work that we do in nursing around trauma-informed care and ACEs and safe and healthy communities, addressing disparities and systemic racism that are all re related to this area of work. Um, the, you know, when I think about studying this kind of, um, this area of research, um, I'd like to think we can, um, the, what we fund through NANR can ideally do as much as we can to fund that which is really prevent, on the prevention end of gun violence. Um, I'd like to hear um, maybe you, Dr. Simon, and even Dr. Hunter, if you can talk a little bit about um, what might be possible in the area of policy um, related research. Uh, the um, in the NANR's priorities and area of focus, you know, we're looking at where nurses work in terms of justice, schools, and homes. I think that there's a lot we can be doing relevant to those areas, even more so than some of the other areas we list around healthcare and clinics, et cetera, which feel a little more downstream. Um, 
So, and I think in terms of our NINR priorities around social determinants of health, population and community health, prevention, health promotion, these are a perfect fit. Some things um, if folks could talk about a little bit is, is for one thing, this, um, this policy um, area, you, you brought up um, de- developing and testing effective strategies and interventions. Could this include policy research? Yeah, I'm happy to start. I think that's a great point. Um, to answer your question, yes, um, our funding opportunity announcements explicitly do include policy evaluation research. Of, of guns? Of any type of policy. So that's what I was just about to say, that okay. you know, when looking at opportunities to address upstream drivers of homicide, suicide, um, as well as racial disparities and other disparities, it's important to consider the underlying conditions, right? So there's there's opportunities to evaluate policies related to housing, related to education, related to employment, um, related to economic supports. We've supported evaluations related to earned income tax credits, for example, and have shown substantial benefits in terms of reductions in risk for interpersonal violence and suicide, but also um, policies related to firearms are also specifically mentioned in our NOFOs and um, could be appropriate for funding. Um, This last cycle that I mentioned in 2022, we are supporting an evaluation related to um, ERPO laws, extreme risk protection order laws. Um, The focus of that project is more around understanding how to better implement ERPA laws within states because there's some real challenges associated with implementation. So the the PIs are look, and that team, you know, are looking for ways to enhance ERPO um, limitation, ERPO implementation in states that have those those laws. But um, I agree with you that, you know, there's some real benefits in terms of evaluating, rigorously evaluating policies because they can have benefits at the population level. Um, and in particular, benefits for addressing the underlying drivers and reducing inequities. Great, great. And and it seems as we just saw in California, as an example, California with some of the strictest gun laws also had um, a big recent spate of mass shootings, et cetera. So clearly there's more we need to know about, about what policies work under what conditions, et cetera. So that's fabulous to hear. Um, the... Another thought I've had, and um, this is this is more for us as the um, as the council. Um, and then I have um, one more question for you, Dr. Simon. But the a thought for us as the council is as we think about this and um, doing more in the area of as much upstream prevention in this area as possible. We have to also be thinking about having reviewers that are skilled in reviewing these kinds. Of proposals that are going to be far less um, likely to be more biomedical or care, more downstream healthcare oriented. So um, gaining reviewers and growing reviewers that can um, adequately review these kind of proposals. So that's a thought for us, I think, as a council. And then I have one more just kind of technical question, which uh, Dr. Hunter kind of alluded, mentioned this too, but um, both of you mentioned that uh, the suicides and homicides um, are the highest now as they were in the early 90s. So do we have any kind of, do we have any, um, why did they come, what brought them down after that period? What do we know about what made them high then and what brought them down um, afterward that we can learn from that period in, our, in the early 90s. And I'll stop there. So I can start. Um, I mean, I think one key issue is this increase, as Dr. Hunter mentioned and as I mentioned, that we saw between 2019 and 2020 is at a level that we've never seen before in terms of the firearm homicide rates, that 35% increase in one year, it's, it's, we've never seen a jump up like that. So that makes us really want to understand what was it about the, the conditions and circumstances under COVID that so dramatically influenced those rates. 
And, you know, when, when looking at that and the explanations that have been offered um, for the increase, you know, people talk about the challenges related to maintaining social connections, the challenges related to economic stressors, challenges related to accessing services. At the same time as a country, we also saw substantial concerns about law enforcement um, uh, use of force in communities. We saw multiple protests related to that. And there were, in many communities, law enforcement was struggling because of the issues around COVID, right, and maintaining protect, appropriate safety protocols related to COVID. But then also um, there was significant distrust on the part of the community because of the examples of inappropriate use of force. And so there were challenges related to traditional um, aspects of community-oriented policing that in many ways, some people have attributed the decline that you were talking about over time in homicide rates subsequent to the mid-1990s to a variety of things. Um, you know, in the mid-1990s, when we were last saw the peak in homicide rates, that was around the time of the crack cocaine epidemic, right? And we saw a substantial infusion of firearms into the hands of young people, young, young boys and young men in urban communities in particular. And that was associated with increases in firearm homicide rates. We saw once the crack cocaine epidemic subsided, um, we saw improvements in law enforcement to some extent. We saw communities also recognizing and beginning to tackle interpersonal violence and homicide as a public health issue through more comprehensive approaches. And I think all of those factors have been combining to result in the reductions that we've seen. Sure. Um, but now that we're seeing this increase under COVID, it causes us to take a step back and reflect on, and I think additional research is needed to more fully understand what exactly happened in the, during yeah. this time to result in such an unprecedented increase. So let me stop there. Professor Dawes. All right, thank you, Dr. Zank. So, and, and Dr. Simon, thank you. And of course, Dr. Hunter for the insightful presentation. I'm, I'm curious about the FASTER program, if you can you know, share a little more insight into that. You talked about um, the fact that there are 10 states uh, that are sharing data right now, and I wanted to know if there are more states. So who are those 10 states, and are there more states um, and state health departments in particular that are being approached or at least showing some interest in participating in the program and sharing that data? That's a great question. And what I'll do is I'll put in the chat, um, the link to the page, the specific page that lists the grantees. Um, and we are very excited about FASTER. Um, we just think this, this syndromic platform is such a great way to get near real-time access to the non-fatal emergency department visits for firearm-related injuries. We're actually, ju we just released uh, a NOFO, um, uh, we're in the process of releasing a NOFO on, uh, that expands um, that focus beyond firearm injuries to include other forms of interpersonal violence as well. Um, and we, with additional funds, right now the funds are not available, but with additional funds, we do hope in the future to be able to expand the number of sites. But the funding is basically allowing the states to um, apply syndromic definitions, which take advantage of a variety of different search strategies within a record. Um, to identify cases that meet a particular definition, in this case, it's firearm injury, um, and to be able to describe those, um, they share them in, in aggregate. You know, within the community, they can detect um, increases much more quickly um, as a result of being able to access the data. So our funding is allowing them to apply the definitions, um, understand the patterns, and then to disseminate it locally. So. And, and can I just follow up one more? I just wanted to ask you one quick thing then. So. You know, I understand the, the funding is limited. Is this something that perhaps the CDC Foundation um, would be able to help with? I'm just curious um, in terms of private funding. Yeah, we. Um, that's a great question. We're actively engaged with the CDC Foundation on, on multiple projects and activities, and we work with them to understand what gaps and opportunities the CDC sees would resonate the most with them and the foundations that they work with. So we're in ongoing conversations with them about those types of activities. Thank you. Dr. Lowe. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Simon uh, for um, bringing this to our uh, focus and attention today. 
I, um, being Native American, and this may be a little shift away from your strategic target uh, focus, but um, we are, uh, since a lot of our population is rural and given some economic challenges, um, food insecurities, we are seeing um, an increase in the use of firearms and especially for hunting. And um, so one of the things that's coming to our attention is that there are maybe unintentional injuries. And then there are other types of injuries like noise-induced hearing loss because of the non-protection, um, um, you know, when using the firearms, et cetera. And so, um, and it's it's um, quite astounding, some of the, the increases that we're seeing, that we're seeing a sharp incline. And so I'm, I'm just uh, curious to see if some of the initiatives would this this focus uh, for prevention, and there are really no real good evidence based prevention uh, for for the this issue, especially among native uh, populations. So I'm just curious to to learn if if some of these initiatives would uh, help uh, you know to be able to um, um, either test or develop prevention interventions, et cetera. Thank you. I'm happy to, to start. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, there have been several studies that have described increases in firearm purchases um, in the recent past. I'm not aware, and I'd be curious to know if, if you are, if, um, if that's been documented in the tribal populations as well. You're seeing increases, and that might explain some of the increases that you just described. In terms of the research, there are several projects that we're funding right now that um, are not specific to tribal populations, but are specific to young people and to rural populations that might be relevant um, in order to, they're focused on educating strategies to better educate and support young people around um, firearm safety. And so like one of the, one of the projects I'll mention is um, at the University of Washington, they're looking at um, culture, longitudinal patterns, and safety promotion of handgun carrying among rural adolescents and the implications for injury prevention. And then there's another um, project that's focused more on, um, uh, on young people and bystander interventions. And it's, it's really interesting. They're working with um, 50 4-H shooting sports clubs um, and um, working to enhance firearm safety practices among young people and to help young people feel empowered that they know about what appropriate firearm storage storage and safety practices are and that they can um, intervene to help other young people um, to be safe with firearms as well. So those are a couple of examples. They're not specific to tribal populations, but they may have relevance um, to the types of issues that you were just describing. And if I can jump in, I'll say that absolutely, I think many of our funding opportunities, you know, this would be spot on. We've talked about suicide and homicide and intimate partner violence, but um, we are definitely uh, also looking at unintentional injury, prevention, um, firearm uh, safety, you know, safe storage. So all these things that you're talking about, I think are well aligned. And I think the other thing that you mentioned that's really important are some of the unintended, you know, the unintended consequences, like you said, you know, hearing damage, uh, that's, that's, those health outcomes are squarely within NIH's interest. And so, um, you know, I, I think this would be very welcome. And like Dr. Simon said, uh, we have a range of projects that I think touch on some of these issues, and we'd like to continue to grow uh, that portfolio um, in, uh, in, all, in many populations, including tribal populations. So thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. Any last burning questions or comments? This has been a really helpful discussion, so thank you. Okay, with that, I want to thank Tom, thank Betty, and thank everyone again for that really great discussion. And of course, Christine as well, thank you for joining us. So it is now 2.54 Eastern, um, so let's take a break. 
Let's go to 305 Eastern. Is that all right? Any concerns about that? All right, perfect. Let's do it. See you at 305. Well, let me uh, get us started by introducing um, our last uh, agenda item really of the day before we go into closed session. Um, so um, next we'll be presenting to you some concepts for future NINR research opportunities within our firearm injury prevention strategic imperative. NINR staff, uh, AAAS fellow, Dr. Shweta Singh, and program officers, Drs. Karen Huss and Karen Keel, will present a concept on firearm injury prevention in community healthcare settings. Following their presentation, council member Dr. Johnson will offer comments to open the session. Dr. Singh, uh, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Zenk, and to the council for allowing us to present this concept. Um, I am Dr. Shweta Singh, and, al and along with my colleagues, Dr. Karen Huss and Dr. Karen Kale, will be presenting this concept on firearm injury prevention in community healthcare settings. Next slide, please. Firearm injuries and deaths are a serious health crisis in the United States, unparalleled anywhere else in the world. Firearm fatality rates in the U.S. have reached a 28-year high. <clears throat> in just 2020 alone, there were 45,222 firearm-related deaths. That equates to approximately 124 deaths daily. And non-fatal firearm injuries are even more common, with approximately two injuries for each death reported. Males account for more than 85% of victims of firearm injuries and deaths. These figures include both intentional and unintentional injuries caused by firearms. Alarmingly, intentional firearm-related assaults comprise about 70% of all medically treated firearm injuries. And as Dr. Hunter mentioned earlier, Firearms are used in more than half of all suicides in the United States, and suicidal acts using firearms have the highest fatality rate, with nearly 90% ending in death. Next slide, please. Firearm injury is also a source of health disparities in the United States, disproportionately impacting marginalized populations. Black individuals have firearm homicide rates 10 times greater than white individuals. According to recent data, compared to non-Hispanic white men, homicides were up to 22.5 times higher among non-Hispanic Black men and up to 3.6 times higher among Hispanic men. As you can see on the right, there's also notable differences in intentional firearm injuries related to the poverty level of the community with the highest homicide and suicide rates being in the communities with the highest poverty levels. Next slide, please. Firearm injuries and deaths vary geographically as well. According to the CDC, firearm-related death rate in rural communities was 28% higher than in the urban due to higher rates of suicide in rural communities. Another example of the urban rural disparity has been seen in hospitalizations for firearm injury in children, which are lo lower for urban than rural with five to nine-year-olds and 10 to 14-year-olds. Unintentional firearm injuries are the most common among these age groups. Next slide, please. Firearm injury has ramifications beyond the individual, including significant impacts on families and communities and substantial costs related to care, lost income, and the legal system. Firearm violence is a complex problem that requires attention to the context in which individuals live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. In other words, it requires attention to the social determinants of health that contribute to firearm injury. One priority issue in reducing the threat of firearm-related injury is the normalization of firearm injury prevention practices in routine healthcare, including individual, family, organization, and community-focused interventions. Next slide, please. These data show that the problem of firearm injury and deaths are context-dependent. 
research to improve primary and secondary prevention in the healthcare setting should prioritize the most pressing local needs and improve meaningful and sustained community engagement to achieve measurable, meaningful, and sustainable results at the population level. Next slide, please. The purpose of this concept is to advance research to reduce firearm injury and related health sequela through the development, evaluation, and translation into routine practice of primary and secondary preventative interventions in community healthcare settings. Prevention interventions are needed to address firearm morbidity and mortality due to both intentional injury, including suicide, and unintentional injury. Under this initiative, NINR is interested in novel, creative approaches to firearm injury prevention directed at multiple points along the primary and secondary prevention continuum to identify risk factors, reduce exposure in individuals, families, and populations, and prevent injury and reoccurrence of injury. In alignment with the mission and the focus of a holistic, contextualized approach to optimizing health for all people, NINR prioritizes research that meaningfully incorporates social determinants of health as primary drivers of health. Effective and sustainable solutions to the challenge of firearm injury prevention in healthcare settings will demand the integration of a social determinants of health perspective. Next slide, please. Nursing's contribution to injury prevention in the varied settings where nurses practice will be emphasized. For this concept, community healthcare settings include, but are not limited to, primary care centers, including federally qualified centers, non-hospital walk-in and same-day health services, schools, pharmacies, and pharmacy-based clinics, vaccination clinics, mobile health units, home health care, workplaces, and other local settings where health care is provided, such as WIC offices. Next slide, please. Some of the research questions to be addressed include, what screenings, directed assessments, and brief education interventions can be customized for you to specific community health care settings? What models of care best leverage nurses' unique skills, perspectives, and relationships with people and organizations with whom they interact to normalize firearm injury prevention activities in community health care settings? How do social determinants of health affect the efficacy or effectiveness of firearm injury prevention programs, their implementation and routine practice, and their sustainability? My colleague, uh, Dr. Kale, will now share some examples. Next slide, please. Thank you. So some of the examples of projects or initiatives might include initial testing of feasibility, acceptability, and efficacy of a universal screening approach to identify at-risk home environments. Another example might be testing preventive interventions adapted from other public health models that have been successfully integrated into practice, such as those that have addressed seatbelt use, smoking cessation, uh, risk factors for alcohol abuse, breast cancer screenings, and others. Implementation effectiveness and or pragmatic trials focusing on sustainability of the intervention might be another option, as would be developing and testing integrated models of preventive care that span health care to the community. A couple of examples of possible projects might be nurses screening for firearm exposure in the home at vaccination clinics, or implementing assessment for firearm knowledge in primary care visits at federally qualified healthcare centers. Next slide, please. This initiative aligns with NINR guiding principles of addressing today's pressing health challenges and being better prepared for the future. The concept really does utilize all of the NINR research lenses and focuses on the many community settings where nurses work and people receive health care. As you heard from Dr. Huss, um, this addresses health equity and social determinants of health. It also addresses population and community in a couple of ways. First, um, projects may have a multi-level focus or a community level. 
and all projects should incorporate a community engagement. Overall, the project is focused on prevention of firearm injuries. And we wanted to also bring in the systems and models of care lens because we see that there's a real need to implement and evaluate interventions and programs that address prevention of firearm injury that are embedded in existing models of healthcare and that offer new models of care in settings where people are already receiving health care. We know that there are several other firearm injury and violence initiatives and funding opportunities, as you've heard earlier today from Dr. Hunter and Dr. Simon. NINR is participating in several of these. When we developed this concept, we actually reviewed these and other federal firearm injury initiatives very carefully. And we looked at areas where NINR could make a unique contribution that weren't already emphasized in those funding opportunities. We saw that there was a gap related to the focus on healthcare settings, particularly with non-hospital or community settings, and with inclusion of unintentional firearm injuries. Therefore, this concept focuses on community healthcare settings where people interact with nurses as part of their daily lives. It also capitalizes on the public trust in nurses and how nurses are embedded in communities. We also want to point out that the concept fits remarkably well in the NINR research framework with a focus on the settings where nurses work, using multiple research lenses, and seeking to impact both policy and practice. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention to this concept and letting us present it, and we look forward to the discussion. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Johnson. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that excellent presentation and for this um, for, the, for this topic that it's clear that um, a lot of thought has gone into, and it's really um, it's really exciting to see where this aligns with NINR's uh, strategic plan and uh, specific areas of expertise. Um, I really appreciated the um, the 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 wide range of settings that are included in this um, initiative. So the the um, the def definition of community healthcare setting to include schools, pharmacies, mobile health units, workplaces, and really uh, casts a wide net. And I think it does really, as you just mentioned in one of your last comments, um, really does illustrate this gap that is a unique opportunity for NINR focused science uh, to contribute and so um, and to have quite an impact. So I, um, a really well done um, crafting of this. I also really like the focus on normalizing prevention screening and interventions in these settings, because I think that's going to be critical. And as I was reading through the concept um, before hearing any of the presentations today, um, I kept um, I kept thinking about just the politicalization and the polarization uh, in society right now on so many different levels. And certainly, um, um, I know we're not supposed to say gun control, but uh, you know, firearm uh, uh, mortality and morbidity prevention is right there with it. And so just thinking through as this research goes forward in NINR in particular, um, how to how to both conduct this research and contextualize this research in such a divided uh, socio-political um, climate and across different, uh, across the different settings and different uh, areas, urban versus rural uh, and regional. So just thinking through how that's going to play out. And um, and I, and also thinking through, um, um, you mentioned the other the other prior public health initiatives that may have grappled with some of these same things, seatbelts in particular, uh, where where the public health uh, professionals and others are um, um, are requiring um, uh, safety precautions that may uh, come at odds with someone's individual sense of um, 
free will and uh, what they want to do. And so learning from those as well as smoking in public places and other, and other areas. So these other things, what lessons can be learned from those experiences to play out here? Because I do think this is going to be uh, as, as critical as it is, it's, um, it's going to be uh, walking a few tight ropes in terms of um, how, how different uh, populations react to it. Um, I also thought that this is a great opportunity to learn in these various settings and with various populations, who are the trusted messengers? Who are the ones that are going to be, um, uh, um, that the public is going to be okay with both doing the screening as well as whatever interventions are appropriate? And I think this is a great um, uh, concept to begin to flesh that out more. Um, and also really learning from, um, to do screening for this in these different settings, um, what approaches to screening have yielded in other, for other topics, have yielded reliable and valid data? And how can we move forward with making sure that when, um, if there's universal screening across these settings, how it's asked in a way that gets um, valid answers and, and data is going to be critical. And also thinking through uh, developmentally appropriate uh, approaches to both screening and intervention across these. So if if part of this is working with uh, children and adolescents versus adults and older um, individuals, what sorts of approaches need to be taken that are developmentally appropriate? And I think this um, this concept really lends itself nicely to that. Um, and then I just, I the, you know, it was only a two-page document, but it got me really, um, uh, it provoked a lot of uh, uh, interest in a lot of the the different um, intersections of firearm safety screening and intervention with IPV, with substance use, with mental health, with existing red flag laws, and I think um, it's just so many different um, opportunities that I think this opens the door to help understand this really critical and urgent urgent. Uh, public health issue that's, as we've seen through the data today, is getting worse very quickly. And so um, those are some of my initial reactions. I'm excited to see this go forward, and um, thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Others? No, it's been a long day. Um, okay. Well, really appreciate um, all your comments, Mallory, and um, thank you uh, to my NINR colleagues. Um, so we have one last presentation and time for discussion. Um, so next up is Dr. Tarlove. Um, she's going to present a concept on education and training in firearm injury prevention research. And then following that, Council Member Dr. Fitzpatrick will offer comments to open discussion. Dr. Tarlove. Thank you, Dr. Zank. I'm excited to present this concept addressing training in firearm injury prevention research, which, like all of our concepts, represents the ideas and efforts of a whole team of people. Next slide, please. As Dr. Zank mentioned, the issue of firearm injury prevention will be our first strategic imperative for NINR and a key initiative in our efforts to implement our strategic plan. This is because we believe that this is not just a criminal justice problem, it's a public health problem and a health equity problem. And we believe in the potential for nurse-led research in this area to make a difference. As you heard from our earlier presenters, firearm injury is a major cause of morbidity and mortality. And it's not only the victims of firearms that suffer from firearm violence, but families bystanders and communities experience long-term effects as well. And as was highlighted in our previous presentations, in order to prevent firearm injury to individuals, families, and communities, research is needed on viable strategies to mitigate the risk of firearm injury and its sequelae. In order to conduct this research, a well-trained, integrated, and collaborative research workforce is needed. And this was one of the things that came up as a recommendation among panelists at our workshop in November. Nurse scientists are well poised to step 
into the forefront of this field of firearm injury prevention research. And the purpose of this concept is to build capacity for this research. Next slide, please. The overall goal is to create educational and training initiatives to advance firearm injury prevention research, applying nursing's holistic contextualized perspective and NINR's research lenses and addressing disparities in firearm injury and related health sequelae. These efforts must include content and experiences that prepare individuals to design and conduct rigorous research that builds on existing knowledge. Equally important is an emphasis on partnerships with other disciplines and communities. Next slide. This concept provides the flexibility to build nursing scientist capacity for firearm injury prevention research through multiple initiatives. We envision building this capacity through programs that will equip nursing researchers with tools, methods, and knowledge of firearm injury prevention, build cohorts, and develop partnerships to conduct innovative, collaborative, and strategic-driven research and address health disparities and sequelae of firearms injury, including where nurses practice, like homes, schools, workplaces, clinics, justice settings, in the community as well as hospitals. Next slide. These goals of building capacity for firearm injury prevention research are overlapping and synergistic. We're anticipating that specific initiatives developed from this concept will be designed to accomplish multiple aims. For example, an, in an initiative involving training grants for firearm injury prevention research, we would expect that a cohort of trainees and mentors would share knowledge and strategies. The training could include methods or other skills instruction for tackling the health disparities in this field as well or establishing a short course on methods and design to tackle firearm injury prevention would not only be right to build cohorts of students and uh, faculty, but also for developing partnership across disciplines to bring diverse perspectives on the sequelae of firearm injury to better develop prevention strategies. Facilitating joint meeting with other NIH funded research programs in firearm injury prevention or health disparities would enhance training of nursing scientists. And developing initiatives to train nurse scientists in conjunction with ongoing clinical firearm injury prevention research would be a terrific way to incorporate the nursing perspective into other programs and enhance training especially if research settings are the places where nurses practice. Next slide, please. Getting nursing researchers trained and in the forefront of this field is the overall objective of this concept. I hope that I've conveyed a variety of possibilities for training, knowledge building, and partnership for nursing researchers, and we welcome your comments. Indeed. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Um, I'm trying to unmute, Anne. Okay, well, let's try this again. So thank you. Um, I echo the comments of everyone else today on how timely and important this issue is, and it's really exciting to see all these initiatives come forward. I can tell you at um, the Children's Hospital I'm affiliated with, this is on the forefront of every frontline medical provider. And what I'm seeing is this really interesting trend in our trainees. They're very interested in this issue. So when this actually rolls out, I think you're going to have tremendous enthusiasm and support for this training. Um, I was also thinking about the comments from earlier today about the T32 mechanisms and some of the biases that we have. And would also encourage you as you roll out these initiatives to not just focus on additional T32 training slots, but to really think about how we might target people that wouldn't necessarily be included by those mechanisms. And it sounds like you have many ideas, conferences, and so forth. But 
um, I think this is wonderful work and I, I thank you for your efforts. Thanks, Anne. Other questions or comments? Gucci. Um, yeah, no, this is great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Was, I'm really looking forward to seeing sort of the outcomes of this. Um, it seems as though building on the social determinants, really teaching them how to address some of those is going to be pot a potential outcome of this. And, and for me, then the potential translation to other trainings in other areas. So it's going to, it'll be interesting to look at that. Thank you. Yeah, I do think it's interesting as well, because this is a very politicized issue that was alluded to earlier and having a group, a cohort of trainees who can get together and really talk through some of the politics that they're facing. Um, it sounds like there's going to be a tremendous explosion of knowledge where we describe the problem and this next phase of training is really focused on the implementation. So these researchers are going to have some of those political barriers, if you will, where institutions may not completely be on board. And um, I, I really like the, the cohort uh, mentality because I think there's going to be strength in numbers to make change. I'm hopeful, and maybe you mentioned this, that um, there are trainees, just based on what John was mentioning earlier, in terms of trends that he's seeing in his community, um, trainees from, from those communities, as well as um, some of the rural communities, reflecting on some of the things I've heard um, from families as well. Pat? Thank you. Um, yeah, this is such an important area. I think we all agree on that. And it's also an a area that the National Academy of Medicine is focusing on this year, uh, firearm safety. Uh, I just wanted, you know, with the Office of Behavioral Science, I probably got their Christine Hunter's office wrong, um, the title, but with so much interest in this, you know, I think the partnerships are critical and, you know, that NINR doesn't want to lose some of its other places where they're claiming their own. I mean, we should be leaders in this. It's, it's a, it's a problem facing society that, that, that there's nobody could doubt that, you know, I mean, it's on the news. We have more mass shootings, you know, than days in the year and it's it's clearly a problem but um you know i've just there's a lot of how we partner and work with others in this big space i think is going to be important so we continue to have things that are specifically nursing science does is that resonating with anybody you understand what i'm saying you know, some of the stuff that we're doing. We just need to make sure that we're also leaders in this and we're, and we're participating in collaborators, not just leading, but also that we maintain our leadership in other areas. Thanks for sharing that. Does anyone else want to add, John? Yeah, I think I could pick up a little bit on that, Pat, in the, in the sense that, you know, um, nurses especially in tribal communities, are very respected and very um, uh, looked to, to whether you're Native or not Native, and um, to bringing, you know, a healthcare perspective because of the um, holistic socialization that nurses usually are uh, provided in their formative education process, et cetera. In saying that, um, nurse scientists are also respected in Native and tribal communities. And so, and, and um, the, the, the problem is we're so limited, and especially if you're Native, we're so limited, but also others. And, and, and we could provide the entree for other scientists, and especially nurse scientists. So I know when I go into a new a community that a tribal community that I might not be known, I always introduce myself first as a nurse and then as a researcher. 
And so um, it, it does open up a lot of doors. And saying that, I think that there are so many places for nurse scientists to be in this space, in this firearm prevention, in a lot of communities, especially, but especially tribal communities. And I, I, you know, one of the areas is I think of school settings. School settings are just one of the greatest uh, places and spaces to be, to be able to do a lot of this work, especially in tribal communities, and to reach the, uh, you know, a population of multiple ages that are school aged. And so I'm, I'm excited about this and thank you for, you know, the work that's being done to bring this uh, to focus and uh, look forward to, you know, seeing some initiatives and some mechanisms to where we can, um, you know, hopefully um, do the do the needed work. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree, John. I think there's so many places that, you know, I think of home health, you know, if this could be part of a safety you know, you do in home health, you know, you do safety checks about whether there's rugs, you know, that somebody's going to trip on. But maybe it's also about firearms and firearm safety. There's so many places that nurses and their scientists can take the leadership in, in this. I just worry. I also, I guess I worry about palliative care and end of life issues and the, some of the other areas that we've, we've been known for that I still think I want to that we need to invest in. I guess that's what I was getting at. Thanks, Pat. Cindy, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna chime in and agree with Pat that I think this is crucially important, um, but I'm not sure that it can be the single focus. You know, I think because we are holistic, we need to be thinking about social determinants of health and the lifespan in a much broader way than saying, if we, you know, we're going to solve the firearm problem and that is our entire reason for doing nursing science. So I, I'm just going to agree with her. I think this is crucially important, um, but I would not want it to erode the other really strong pieces of the portfolio. I wouldn't want it, I want it to happen, but I don't want other areas of the portfolio to suffer in order to make it happen. And the idea that NINR now has more money in this year's appropriation gives me some hope that we have the expanded capacity to be able to do more than one focus. Thank you. Others want to add? I guess I would add to that and say, I don't know, yes, and perhaps that um, that this could be an area of firearm prevention research, could be an area upon which we can um, learn more and get better at getting more upstream in all these, these areas of our portfolio in nursing science. It could be, a, a, you know, an amazing starting place that would be relevant for a number of other kind of more upstream areas. That's exact, gosh, you said that so beautifully, Betty. Yep, that's what I was thinking too. I was trying to get at that generalizability because I, I was starting to feel that way myself. You know, it's like, wait, whoa, <laughs> there's so much. But I think learning, I've learned so much even today, listening to all these presentations on its relevance to so many other health issues. Thank you. So this was a really helpful discussion. Uh, really appreciate um, all these ideas, um, people's reflections, um, uh, and people's uh, yeah thoughts as we move forward. So um, yeah, to clarify, firearm injury prevention is uh, you know our first strategic imperative. It is not uh, intended to be the entire NINR portfolio. So it is a strategic imperative. Um, so. Uh, which we, again, think is really important. And I think we think nurse science can make a huge difference given the perspective we bring. Uh, it's very consistent with the lenses of our strategic plan and our mission. So it is our first strategic imperative, but it is not uh, intended to be the entire portfolio. So thank you for raising that, Pat, and for everyone for jumping in there. 
So with that, I know it's been an exciting day, um, but uh, we are getting on in the day. So thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Anne and everyone else for contributing to that conversation. Um, so that it does conclude our presentations, but before we wrap up open session, we'd like to open the floor for additional questions, comments, and announcements from Council. So the floor is yours. Anything you'd like to um, share? Um, I, I'd like to share one thing. One of the things that I've heard from people, and I've, I've given it some thought but not deeply it, you know people we used to have the centers and and it was a, the elitist universities that had them you know the R ones without a doubt um, but they you know they missed the collaboration that that brought um, brought across universities and with the focus on increasing the diversity of the workforce and social determinants of health um, and maybe it's through T32s or something like that. And I don't know, or partnering with and partnering with people that don't have T32s, you know, or or something. There, I think there's something that we and I and R could do. I don't know what the answer is, but to help build the collaborations across universities, both those with resources and those that are under-resourced and serving. Um, URM, you know, uh, students. And, you know, I, it's just an idea. It's not well thought through, but I think that there's some way to do that. It, we could, it could be helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Other, do people have thoughts about that or any reaction? Um, Hannah, are you familiar with the RCMI program that NIMHD funds? The, the RCMI. RCMI. So I put it in the chat. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know how this works, but it would be awesome if NINR could do something like that and establish these types of centers. So these are at, so we have one of them. We joined the network about uh, four and a half years ago. Um, it's a different type of funding. It's U54 funding. I don't quite understand all of it, but. Um, but it's a, it's sort of what you describe in terms of, you know, it's non R1 trying to give infrastructure. Yeah, and I've heard that years ago um, there was some funding for the like research the for bridge a bridging funding. And somebody told me that UCSF actually did it with you, some uh, university in Puerto Rico, and there's some people that said it didn't work, you know, and I don't, I don't know what the lessons are. I know some of the people that I could talk to about what those lessons are, you know, um, but some way to, to help um, share the resources and increase the collaboration, I think would be good. One of the things uh, about that mechanism, and I'm in no way trying to put anybody down who's at an R1, goodness gracious, no. Um, but when one of the leverages that we had at San Diego State, because we do a lot of partnerships with UCSD and others in the area, which we very much appreciate, but that with that funding, we were not allowed to establish any partnership um, with them. And so it really forced, um, it sort of, gave us the freedom to say we're not allowed to do it. So, you know, it's the funding is staying here. Now, now what's happening is a lot is going to our community partners, which is really great. And they're getting a little upset about it. But um, yeah, so that that's the other unique thing about that mechanism is you, you couldn't give it to the R1 institution. Yeah. No, thanks for raising that, uh, Pat. It is um, an important issue. We're we're happy to think more about it. If if you have, you know, or anyone on council has additional thoughts, please feel free to reach out and and happy to talk more about it. But we'll we'll certainly consider that as we go forward. So thanks for sharing that. Um, anything else before we end uh, open session?
Okay, well, thank you to everyone for your attention, your participation today. It's really been an exciting day. We really appreciate your engagement, your ideas, and your feedback, and your support. So open session is now ended.